Today, I'm speaking with Justin Best. Justin, thank you so much for joining me today. Hey, no problem, Tim. It's great to be here, bro. It is an absolute honor and a privilege beyond what I can say in words to, to be speaking with you. Justin is one of my heroes. I've been watching his videos for a long time, as I know a lot of other people have, and your name has just organically come up in a lot of uh, interviews I've done where people have just said, hey, do you know Justin Best? And I'm like, yep, I sure do. So this is great to finally meet you. And just for a quick bio, uh, Justin is married. He has four children. He lives in Florida, and he is a content creator on YouTube, TikTok, and Spotify. I'll have the links beneath our video. Please go like and subscribe and check out his awesome content there. And believe me, you will go down the rabbit hole if you do, and it's well worth it. Uh, he studied marketing and human resources at DeVry University and Keller Graduate School of Management. He was in the Marine Corps for 13 years, traveled quite a bit in over 20 countries. So uh, besides that bio, can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? Yeah, sure, Tim. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for having me on the channel. I really appreciate your content as well. And I'm uh, just, I'm shocked and flattered to hear your intro of me. That's very, uh, very, very kind. Um, thank you very much. But yeah, you know, Tim, I love to golf, I hang out with my kids. I homeschool my kids. So uh, in between that, I go to the gym, I golf, I try and shoot some hoops every once in a while. For several years there, I was just wholly focused on philosophy and Christian history and things like that. And I didn't get a lot of extracurriculars in, but Lately, I've been learning to take care of myself and get back out there and do stuff like that. So my family appreciates it. Of course, I appreciate it. But uh, my my number one hobby really is just to investigate, ask questions, and try and get to the bottom of, you know, the historical mysteries of philosophy and things like that. So again, just super excited to be here. Mm, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. And uh, yeah, I, I definitely hear you on the idea of getting back to kind of, I guess you might call it real life. I mean, YouTube is real life in one sense, but it's like you just getting out to nature and not taking your camera with you or, you know, keeping your phone off and just like actually doing real life and focusing. It's, it's, it's interesting how much we can get sucked into just there's always some way to make a new video, some way to do something. And always. it's like it's it's like it's not it doesn't actually feed your your the best part of you. And I, I'm in the same boat. So so glad you're doing stuff for yourself. Well, um, we're, of course, here to hear your story. So um. For anyone that doesn't know Justin, you're in for a treat, but um, for, even for anyone that does know Justin already, I think we're going to touch on some aspects of his story in here that might be a little bit different. So uh, Justin, we'd love to hear you kind of start with, uh, you know, what shaped your worldview? Sure. Yeah. So first of all, I was born actually in a Christian home and uh, my father was a Christian since college. And my, mo my mother was as well. And so I was born in the early 80s and I came up in a predominantly Southern Baptist home until I got to maybe uh, 12, 13, we, we switched over to a Calvinistic or more Reformed theology. So we became essentially Presbyterian. And I was in a Presbyterian church probably from 12, 13, all the way until um, I started my own online ministry all the way in 2017. So for a very long time, I'd say uh, almost 20 years, I was a Presbyterian. Uh, during that time, but especially during my childhood, we were extremely involved in literally everything. One of my um, one of the first videos I ever made when I created my Christian Truthers online evangelism channel was about the the Covenant bubble, is what I called it that I grew up in. I went to this school and church called Covenant Presbyterian Church slash Covenant Christian School, and so uh, literally every single one of my friends, especially during my high school years, thirteen to eighteen, in there. Every single one of my friends were Christian. I played on a Christian basketball team. I went to the Christian school, of course. Um, I went to Christian youth group. So I was at the church when the doors were open on Wednesday nights, on Sunday mornings, on Sunday nights, and of course, Friday night youth groups and things like that. All of my close friendships were of the same you know, denominational perspective, and literally it enveloped our entire lives. I had two brothers and two sisters. They were all involved. Uh, my parents were involved in helping out and handing out bulletins and and just sort of uh, i guess you would say giving their time and i, and I kind of carry that with me into my adulthood as well just always trying to give more time to the church uh just volunteering for as much as i could can i ask what I, your just switch over that occurred in denominations and, and perspectives did your parents like kind of thoroughly describe to you what their shift in theology was and why you were going to a different church or did you just have to kind of pick it up along the way <clears throat> that's a good question you know honestly they never really did thoroughly describe to me why there was a shift when it happened from like southern baptist to say presbyterian 
But once we got involved in the Presbyterian Church, they did ensure that we were very well informed about Calvinism in general, about um, John Calvin, of course, Martin Luther, the history of the Presbyterian Church. And in that Christian school also, we spent a lot of time on hermeneutics and church history and theology. And I really actually liked that stuff, even for my young age. Um, I'd like to sit around with the the adults and listen to what they were arguing about in terms of different theological ideas and doctrines. And I just thought it was really, I guess you could say, just exciting and interesting to find out what could have been and what might be. But my parents were, uh, although they did talk amongst themselves and to other parents a little bit about some surface level theological ideas, they didn't spend a whole lot of time with me and my brothers and sisters at home talking about these ideas. They kind of uh, depended upon the church to do that for us. They, I guess they assumed that between youth group church and Sunday school and all that stuff, we'd pick up whatever we needed to. And honestly, that's in a way, that's a big part of my Christian journey as an adult was coming to the realization that I have actually a much higher interest level in these things than my parents even do. And in hindsight, and even again in my adulthood, I saw that they were really more in it for the social aspects, the friendships, the networking. Uh, my dad was a financial advisor, so it was important to find clients. You know, uh, All of our friends and, and, and uh, potential clients and everything were, were through that situation for them. So uh, yeah, you know, my dad would sit with us after dinner uh, almost every day, every night after dinner in high school. And he'd read to us from this book called The Book of Virtues. And it would just spell out what different virtues are, you know, like courage, humility, or kindness, compassion. And then there'd be like, uh, you know, this like stories and scenarios about it. And then you would go around the table talking about it. So he did care a lot about us developing ethics and like virtuous thinking. But other than that, uh, I think my understanding of theology excelled my dad's by the time I was 22, 23, something like that. Hmm. That's interesting. So. I would definitely ditto that too. It's, um, I mean, my dad was very involved in, in it, but it, it just, I could see like, his, you know, his, his, for example, his, his adulthood was often like do your job all day, but then kind of just, you know, take care of stuff all night, watch TV and watch football. Mm -hmm. And, and like, I was literally consumed where, I was the kind of kid who, if you told me part of your homeschooling is to read this one chapter in the systematic theology book, mm -hmm. I would like read the entire book and then the next book of it. Like I just, I couldn't get enough. And it wasn't <laughs> just that, that book, I, by the way, the big, big one. Yeah. Yeah. It wasn't just that. I was like, I would literally study my dictionary for hours and hours a day. Wow. But I just, I was the same way. Like once you get into it and especially once you get into some good teachers, like, you know, good teachers. Uh, mm -hmm. R.C. Sproul and John MacArthur and right John Piper, or, John Piper, or even just the older, you know, uh, Spurgeon, reading some of those great classics, the Puritans. It was like, oh yeah, oh, you just felt like you were in a gold mine, and you you could just it, it wasn't hard. You didn't have to dig. You just you know you just kind of take a step, and there's another gold nugget. And once you kind of as a Christian, you know, taste that, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is the meat of the word that I've been hoping for. This is no mm -hmm. longer the milk, and yeah, it's 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 addicting. It's so true. That reminds me of a book by John Owen, which I think was written in like the 16 something or 17. Maybe it was later than that. Maybe it was in the 1800s. I, just, I don't want to be wrong, but it was called On Sin and Temptation. And it taught you like in old English, which is really difficult to read. And their vocabulary was way better than ours. <laughs> they uh, He taught you how to mortify sin on the mortification of sin, how to essentially like break down your thought processes to destroy the the vile nature of sin as it develops in your brain. And yeah, I remember when I started reading that and how heavy that was having to reread so much of it to try and fully digest what he just said. And I realized like, man, no one in the church is talking like this anymore. That's some really, really deep stuff. So yeah, I know what you mean. It, it can be very addicting to get into it. Yeah, for sure. And I, I was thinking too of um, C.S. Lewis and uh, there's a couple other books that fall in similar categories, uh, authors, but yeah, there, there were some, and I think one of the things that was, just to piggyback off this one more time, I think what was hard for me was in this context of people who you would just think, if you really believe this, then it would have ramifications for you, such as if you really believe people are, are facing an eternity without Christ, 
then don't you want to be more active in evangelism? And if this really is the love letter from the almighty God, like this isn't academics. This is like a relationship. Don't you want to mm-hmm. be in this word all the time? And it it definitely struck me the the contrast. And I, I'm sure there was some arrogance at times, but I think it was just an honest, like, I just, I don't want to be just somebody else. I mm-hmm. want to be, a, you know, a world changer for the Lord. And, um, and of course, you know, that you can't be a world changer if you're not in the word. And it right. definitely became, again, once you do it, you're like, it becomes a habit and you realize, again, in that mentality, um, th- that's like, that's the best life. The best life is to be in the word and then taking the outgrowth of that to your you know ministry and so forth. But it's interesting hearing someone else that's had this similar, a similar background. No, I just, in what you said a, a second ago, it kind of describes the sort of intellectual connection to scripture, so-called vice or versus like a truly, I guess you would say, emotional or psychological connection to it. Spiritual, they would say, in the Christian world, of course. But yeah, I, I, ex- I guess, experienced a lot of existentialism. To this day, I still struggle with a lot of existential thoughts and existentialism in general. But that that is what really led me to take the scriptures so seriously after I got out of the Marine Corps, because I had experienced so much loss and and so much combat and so many of my friends had died and i was very um i guess i had a much more serious take on life and death than a lot of other people that i knew and so they were able to sort of like have this intellectual relationship with the texts that didn't seem to permeate into every other area of their life and thinking all the time and um you see you know some really great scholarly writings and sermons and stuff from people like this who seem to understand it on the surface but when you when you see their daily living it it doesn't jive and for me my daily living was the most important aspect i i, I would I, I was i was at the place where i would rather say nothing and know nothing and just live it correctly to the best of my understanding than come out and act like i'm so smart and i know all this stuff and be completely wrong and Ultimately, that that was my nightmare would be this idea that I would be completely wrong and that God would be mad at me and I'd be like a false prophet and all this stuff because I took it so seriously that I genuinely believed that what I say and the way I lead or mislead someone could be their, it, it could affect their eternity. And I noticed, um, again, I noticed a lot of people in my family and friends and church and stuff didn't really take it nearly as seriously as I did. It, ultimately they some of them people would tell me to calm down they would literally ask me to calm down like pastors and elders and deacons to to chill out some and take a break you know and i'm like this is life and death you know what do you mean take a break I, yeah I, I i get that could i ask just for um context too was there a particular time earlier in life when you would say you officially uh gave your life to christ and officially you know, had an, an act of um, placing your faith in, in Christ's death and resurrection or like, how did that play out earlier? Yeah. So I, I would say that I asked, asked Christ for his forgiveness and his spirit and his cleansing, um, his leadership, like on bended knee with tears in my eyes, several different times in my life. Um, probably the first time was when I was like nine years old, you know, we're sitting in the the Southern Baptist pews and they do the the altar call. And I just heard this really powerful sermon about how terrible and wretched we all are and how desperately in need of Christ we are. And I felt that, you know, that emotional, and again, like they call it spiritual in the Christian church. I now understand it to be emotional and psychological, but I experienced that. I went, you know, I stood up, went down to the front, prayed with the elders. They ended up, you know, scheduling a baptism for me and all that stuff when I was nine. But, um, I would have recurring episodes of this, I guess you would say. Like when I was 12, I went to a Christian summer camp and I spent about a month there. And uh, same thing, you know, we had all these Christian counselors and and, uh, sermons and workbooks and stuff that we would do. And I I had a moment that I'll never forget where when I was 12, I was sitting next to this lake and there was some like, you know, hippie looking Christian guy playing guitar while some you know, like role model to the youth is giving this like heartfelt, heart wrenching sermon about, you know, coming back to Christ. And, and, you know, it's interesting because the way they can sort of get you to feel like you need to rededicate your life to Christ over and over again is to remind you that 
maybe you took it seriously for a while, but you know, over the last couple of years or months or whatever, you know that you've strayed from Christ. You know that you've made decisions that you shouldn't have. You know that your heart isn't always in pursuit of him the way it used to be. So come on down and rededicate yourself to Christ. And so I did that several times, but especially that one time when I was 12. And I really believed at that time that I was certain that I was saved. I was certain that if there was a Holy Spirit, then Jesus was going to give it to me because because I knew in my true heart of hearts that I wasn't playing around, you know, uh, this really meant a lot to me, but obviously I was 12 and <laughs> I went on to make, you know, stupid decisions and be a kid and goof up. And so I had other episodes like that, you know, when I was 15, 17, 23, <laughs> 27, you know, many times I would rededicate my life to Christ because I would go through these periods where I would, I would be worried, like, how can I be certain that I'm saved without question? And I think part of the reason why I fumbled that question so frequently was because I always had a hard time understanding uh, a paradox between sort of the James 2, um, it's faith and works combined that gets you saved versus sort of the Pauline, you know, um, yeah, faith alone, you know, works not required type thing. So even in the Presbyterian church, they, you know, they teach Calvinistic ideas. They talk about predestination, but they also somehow try and weave in this concept that we still have a personal responsibility, even though everything's already been predestined, you know? So I think that conflict in my young mind kept me kind of coming back, like just trying to make sure I'm saved. Do I need to get baptized again and things like that? So it wasn't mm -hmm. until, um, it probably wasn't until I was in my 30s that I really became confident that if, you know, if there's any way that someone can be saved, it, it, it must be me because I literally was living every waking second of my life according to what I understood to be the truth, according to the gospel. So, yeah, I, um, I had a lot of experiences like that, I guess you could say. I had a quick comment and then a question. A uh, comment would be, um, I definitely can relate to to some of that too with one of the big parts of my journeys, uh, journey as a teenager was being exposed uh, through homeschooling to a lot of preachers. Uh, my my parents would just say, basically, pick a 30 minute, um, you know, radio program that you can listen to. And, the, you know, my parents had it on in the background all day long. So mm -hmm. I was getting many more hours of it anyway. But they wanted me to like in my bedroom, pick one of the guys that I'd heard and then listen to it. Just me in my with the radio in my bedroom. And I was uh, picking um, two people, mostly um, Chuck Swindoll and John MacArthur. Chuck Swindoll was pretty much more just like a, you know, you know, grace and all that stuff. He was very, very you know, sweetheart uh, for a Christian. Very nice, you know, uh, just he, he, just, he just wanted to exude love. So mm -hmm. I wouldn't say he did much damage. I don't think he could do much damage, at least from what I got exposed to. But John MacArthur, on the other hand, was a very different story. And I was at that time going through homeschooling at a time when he was going through his audio series and his book on Lordship Salvation, which of mm. course became a huge deal. And it definitely put that in in my on my right my radar too. Like, you know, if you have any part of you that is struggling perpetually with sin, where like you're not willing to give it to the Lord, like you you need to understand that that's a fearful thing because if you truly are are the kind of person that the spirit has come into the spirit's not going to let you just sit on sin and be, be, just be okay with it. That's mm -hmm. not how the spirit works. Mm -hmm. It isn't just an issue of what do you want to do? What are the deepest desires of your heart? It's just, what is the desire of the spirit? If the spirit's in you, he just, he'll just keep moving you to holiness and to repentance. And right. if you're just like, you're not really caring that much about certain sins, it's like, huh, well, maybe I don't have the spirit. I, I never really struggled with the thought of losing my salvation, but I was in a constant, like a OCD of, of reevaluating. Mm -hmm. Is there any part of me? And I think especially once I got into puberty where, you know, you want to look twice at certain things and three and four and five and six and seven times, it's like, wait a second, you know, that's not necessarily the spirit leading me to do that. Mm -hmm. I should be looking only at girls as my sisters in Christ. So does that mean I'm not saved? And mm -hmm. it, it definitely, you know, led to a lot of internal struggles. But my question was going to be, do you feel like Christianity ever kind of brought on any psychological OCD. Like if you, if you do these, you know, 13 things every day or every week, 
and you know you, you pray for at least 10 minutes and you definitely remember any family members that aren't you know they're lost and you definitely you know are praying for the poor and you're definitely praying for the missionaries and you're definitely reading at least two or three chapters a day you know all these things you're definitely reading before you go to bed mm-hmm. whatever it is you know you, you, we all come up with those lists that kind of make us feel like good christians but was there ever a an ocd dynamic for you in your walk with christ where you felt like if if you do these things you're you're you're, you're pretty much evidencing the spirit's definitely moving in your heart yeah, when I was in my 30s, I did. And when I was younger, uh, not so much. I kind of just went along with the leading of, you know, what I w- whatever I was sort of forced to do. I mean, I did care and I was interested in it, um, like intellectually. And I also went through, again, like I mentioned before, I went through periods where I also deeply believed and cared and wanted to also, you know, make sure that I was doing what God wanted me to do. But the sort of OCDs type stuff that you're talking about came in my 30s. After I got out of the Marine Corps in 2015, I went through like an existential crisis. And that's a long story. But as a result of that, I sort of became extremely passionate and zealous for my faith in Christian, my faith in Christ. And it was during that time that I sort of developed some of that uh, OCD. I really believed that I needed to wake up and I needed to see Scripture first thing in the morning. I believed that I needed to fast frequently. I did fast frequently. I I'd fast at least once a week for a day or two. And then every month or so, I'd do like a three or four day fast. And during that time, I would just literally turn off all electronics and just tell my wife to basically give me space and just study scripture. Because I believed that in the fasted state, the spirit would reveal to me more than it would otherwise, because I was taking the... Uh, you know, actionable physical steps to humble myself, et cetera. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I guess you would say I got into a lot of those type of OCD things when I when I went, I, because I, I became Torah observant uh, eventually. And so that led me into a whole two or three year period where my family and I, all of us were very strictly adhering to a, a set of standards and and rules that we believed would keep us holy. So during that period, yeah, I mean, extremely OCD. We only did the Shabbat, the Sabbath on the seventh day of the week, which we believed was Saturday. Um, we didn't eat pork or shellfish ever. Um, I wore the, you know, the tzitzit and well, we didn't partake in any of the pagan holidays. We only kept the seven feast days of Yahweh through the year. And so I spent a lot of time studying for those feast days and preparing them and making, building a sukkah or building food and all this stuff. So yeah, I, I'd say that we, <laughs> not just myself, but my whole family was sort of like spiritually OCD during that period. But I, I know what you mean, like in terms of just personal holiness. Yeah. I, I In my thirties, I really felt like if I wasn't actively, like you said, Lordship salvation was something that I actually, I remember explaining to my dad who was arguing with me when I was still a Christian about my belief towards salvation. And I explained to him kind of where I was at and he goes, Oh, well that's Lordship salvation. That's heresy. And I'm like, what, what do you, what is Lordship salvation? So I went and looked it up because I'd never heard it called that before. And as soon as I looked it up, I'm like, yeah, well, this is correct, dad. You know, <laughs> this is correct. Like if you aren't actively pursuing uh, and walking with Christ, as he says himself, you know, something along the lines of, if you're not willing to take up your cross and follow me, then you're not worthy of me. You know, he says things along those lines many times. And so, um, you know, even even just yesterday, I was writing about how one of his disciples said, hey, I want to follow you and everything, but I got to go bury my dead dad real quick. And he's like, well, let, your, let the dead bury their dead, you know. So there is this uh, huge emphasis on dropping everything to follow Christ. And so I was always asking myself through the days and weeks uh, during my 30s, and what is what I'm doing right now for the kingdom or for myself? And um, that really ruled like 99% of the decisions I made for from 2016 until 2021, honestly. I'm, I'm definitely curious to hear more about the tour observant stuff in a few minutes when we get to that part of the timeline. Do you mind taking us back to the existential crisis and kind of give us the background and what happened there? Yeah, sure. So when I was in the Marine Corps, I joined in 2002, February. I joined, um, let's see, September 11th uh, was when 9-11 happened in 2001. September, October, November, December, January, February. So five months later, I joined the Marine Corps. Um, 
And I actually requested to be an infantry machine gunner. Now, all of my siblings later would end up joining the military too, but they all they all opted to go into intelligence fields and learn different languages and things like that. Later, I actually would end up going into the intelligence field for a little while too, but I really, really, really wanted to go fight bad guys because in high school, I was very much obsessed with the Navy SEALs, pararescue jumpers, um, special operations folks and things like that. And I was super athletic. So I was always trying to challenge myself to um, basically do the exercises and in, in the in-doc courses that you would have to do to get into those things. I was always trying to get ready for that and and, and be ready to pass those in-doc things to get into the, you know, to get into buds for Navy SEALs, for example, things like that. So um, when, when 9-11 happened, it was just three months before I turned 18. And I was homeschooled at the time as well. By the way, I was homeschooled for uh, second half of 10th grade and then 11th and 12th grade as well. So I uh, I was so sort of like patriotic. I was raised on Black Hawk Down, on The Patriot, on Saving Private Ryan. These movies were like a huge part of, of my identity at the time. I, I thought that I, I saw that my dad valued valor and patriotism above everything even above christianity in my opinion looking back he was also a lieutenant colonel in the air force and when i was when i was joining the marine corps he worked for nasa at the time as a space shuttle landing coordinator so um of course he was really proud of me everyone was proud of me for wanting to join the marine corps i um so i, I asked to join the infantry and I ended up getting exactly what I wanted. I went to uh, boot camp and SOI and all this. And by the by the beginning of 2003, just a year or so later, I was on my first deployment. We were already we were in Iraq, and uh, I saw my first taste of combat there. Although on my first deployment in 2003, I only saw only I was only involved in like one firefight, and I actually didn't even pull the trigger because I I didn't see any targets. But in 2004, I went to another on another deployment to Iraq, and this time we we just flew straight to Iraq and we stayed there for eight or nine months. And it was during that time that I was involved in what's considered the bloodiest battle of the Iraq War, which is the Battle of Fallujah Part Two, which is which happened in November of 2004. So um, that battle was like. Had got a lot of press. Uh, my my parents were like watching the news about it every day while we were there. And my um my wife, who I married really young, <laughs> was at home pregnant with my first child while I was there. And uh, in that battle, ultimately, my unit, um, Bravo Company, First Battalion, Eighth Marines, we went in with about 150 something Marines in my unit, and 50 of them were severely injured, and 13 of them were killed. And in the midst of all that, I was involved, like I said before, in somewhere between 200 and 300 firefights. And there's a documentary on uh, the American Heroes channel. And also you can watch it on YouTube for like $1.99 or something uh, called uh, 46 Days of Hell in Fallujah. And also um, yeah, and that, that, that documentary outlines like the, the fierceness of the combat there and everything involved. There were several books written about it afterwards. I ended up being on the cover of one of those. And my friends are all to this day in the Marine Corps Museum. It was just a big deal. And um, I think at the time, after I got done with that deployment and came back uh, and, and was in the Marine Corps, I think the fact that I stayed in the Marine Corps for another you know, eight, nine years, it was nine more years, I think, after that, I think that sort of delayed my existentialism because... Although I saw that the there's a there's a harsh reality between life and death in the real world, and that there really is no main characters in real life, like that's one of the hardest lessons that people learn in combat is that they're the good guys do die in this movie, and the main character does die in this movie, and you're not the main character, and like no one's no one's like immune. Like it's not a joke anymore. When you get over there and, you, and the you know the explosions start going off and you start seeing your buddies get shot in the face right next to you and things like that, you you realize quick that like 
I'm going to die. I'm probably going to die. Like this is, this is happening. You know, there's no protection for me because that guy didn't deserve to die. He's one of the best Marines I've ever known. He's one of the nicest people on earth and he just got shot in the face. So clearly I'm not safe, you know? And so those kind of existential ideas, they don't really come to the surface immediately. When you're in combat, you, you compartmentalize quite well and you adopt a combat mindset, which allows you to sort of have a sense of humor about it and delay processing everything um but most people when they come back from those type of environments and then they're removed from the marine corps entirely which most people are and by the way almost every vietnam that was which is why i feel so bad for them they would do 365 days in combat and then just go straight home like new york home not like to the base to get help like home <laughs> so they were like without help you know um so for me, I think that uh, even though a lot of my friends got immediately out and they immediately started experiencing severe PTSD issues and needing all types of counseling and being depressed and suicidal and all these things, for me, that was delayed nine years because I re-enlisted to go become a combat instructor at Marine Corps headquarters, Quantico. And so I think something about being in that environment and being surrounded by other instructors who were a little bit higher rank like I was and had some combat experience like I did, we all sort of normalized what we had experienced just by being together and by talking about it with students for, for years and years. You see what I mean? To the extent that it didn't hit home, like when I would think about the events that occurred in my Marine Corps career, I would think about them strategically and tactically and operationally but I never thought about it emotionally or psychologically or like how does that change my identity and, and those type of things until, uh, again, I, I was a combat instructor and then I went to Okinawa for a year and then I was a counterintelligence specialist for a year and some change. And then I went to Light Armored Reconnaissance Battalion. Long story short, I got out in 2015. And after I got out, I was solely focused on on, I wanted to prove to myself that my identity wasn't going to ever be wrapped up in being a combat Marine. Like I thought that it would, it would make me stronger or I could prove that I'm not going to be a victim of, of my experiences in the Marine Corps. If I could just go out and, and get a, you know, finish my education, get a higher education and then, and then go dominate the business world and just change my mentality completely and say, you know, I know I was a Marine. I know I experienced that stuff, but that's not who I am. I'm a businessman now. I'm, I'm going to be successful in the real world. You know, I'm not going to rely on this. I, I guess I considered it a crutch at the time, which it was totally wrong uh, thinking. And now I know looking back that this happens to a lot of people who have PTSD and have been through a lot of combat is they feel very guilty about complaining about it. And they feel guilty about uh, saying that they've been impacted or hurt by it because they've because we've seen people lose their hands, limbs, face, everything, even the ones that survived and still look like that and still messed up. And you see these people and you're like, no, they're messed up. Like they they got hurt. I'm fine. Like, you look at me, I have no holes in me. You know, how can I sit here and complain when my buddies look like this? So there's that sort of like tough guy mindset where you, you just say, no, no, like I, I don't, I don't need the help that other people need. And after I got out of the Marine Corps and I started working on business stuff, I, I tried to start my own social media business. I had finished most of my bachelor's degree when I was in the Marine Corps. And by the way, while you're in active duty military, you can take free online free online classes. So I got as much of my bachelor's degree done as I could before I got out while I was teaching uh, combat instructor stuff and everything like that. So when I got out, I had enough um, Montgomery, G oh, I'm sorry, post 9-11 GI Bill benefit left. Because when you, when you get out of the Marine Corps or the military, you have three years of, of school that's paid for for free, essentially. And they'll pay your rent for you while you're taking a full-time load. So I was like, well, shoot, I have enough benefit here to go get my at least one master's degree and finish my bachelor's degree. So that's what I did. I finished my bachelor's in business with a focus in marketing. And then I used more of my benefit to go get a master of business administration, again, with a concentration in marketing. And then later, I actually had more benefit left. So I went and got uh, a master's certificate in human resources. That was more recently. 
Uh, so that was my education thing. But essentially when I finished my master's degree in business and started going into working in, in business or doing marketing and sales jobs, I quickly realized that I totally hate it. Like I hate it so much. I didn't like the community, the atmosphere, the, I didn't like my, my leadership. I just, I just felt like they all had no idea what they were doing. It's weird because when you're in the Marine Corps, you think, you think, well, I'm stuck at this rank until a certain amount of time has gone by and then I can be promoted. And you're like, I have to wait for that, you know? And even then you have to make sure your scores are high to be competitive and get promoted. And you think to yourself, well, when you get in the civilian world, there's nothing stopping you. You don't need rank. You can just go make money and make money and make money and, and rank up if you want to call it that. And I quickly realized that that's not true <laughs> because in the civilian world, people backstab you and take credit and they don't want, they, they, they're they made, they compete with you. Like your, your own coworkers and your, even your own boss will compete with you because they don't want you to make them look bad. And ultimately they don't want it to look like you could do their job. And the Marine Corps, it's the opposite. Like when I got out, I was an E6, about to be E7. So my job was to train younger Marines like constantly. And in the Marine Corps, you you want to train people how to do your job as effectively as they possibly can so that when you die, they can step up and fill your shoes, whether that be in combat or whatever. And also it's just good leadership in general. Like you want to prepare them for the next rank. And there's no like... There's no backstabby competitive stuff and all, you know, because every, it just doesn't work like that. Anyway, try not to get too far off on a tangent here, but once I became sort of like embittered by the civilian world, I guess you would say, um, it was also during a time where um, I was starting to realize that um, I guess I was having existential thoughts that I couldn't get to go away. Every day I'd go to work and I'd have a hard, I just stare at my screen and I have a hard time, like even writing a simple email because I would think to myself, like, what, what bearing does this have on my eternity? Like, this is so stupid. Like, why am I sitting here in this cubicle doing this when I should be out doing something that matters? That's important. Again, my entire life, my entire adult life from 18 until that point had been marked by doing things that I felt were extremely valuable to society and to myself, to my family, sacrificing everything all the time to travel and to work and to fight, et cetera. And so I just started feeling really worthless, like like I'm just wasting away and this is my life now. It sucks, you know? But on top of that, I started to have like night terrors and sleep paralysis. And um, I started feeling depressed. And so when I started looking into remedies for this stuff, I came to the conclusion that this was spiritual. And so I, I thought that maybe I was dealing with demonic activity. Maybe I was being, um, you know, like shown darkness by God to wake me up from my spiritual slumber and revive me into realizing like I need to do that. But something happened to where mm. I came to this conclusion, like, look, I, I believe the Bible's real. I believe it's true. This is again, 2016. I, I think it's more important than anything else in the world. So I literally went in and I wrote a letter to my CEO and I have it somewhere. I, maybe I can share it sometime. <laughs> it's basically this long letter saying I'm quitting my job to, to evangelize the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world and effective. Like right now I quit. I'm going to go spread Jesus's love everywhere. Like literally wrote this to my boss and quit. Mm -hmm. And then um, in August of 2017, I started a YouTube channel called Christian Truthers. And that's where I just decided to pour all of this sort of like, uh, you know, all the mental health and existentialism and all the like depression and all the like anxiety I had built up. I decided to focus all of that energy and, and everything into trying to understand the Bible as best as I possibly could, and then doing my absolute best to explain that to people who, who don't understand, basically. So I started off my ministry just making really simple videos, like, what is faith? And I would pull up the uh, lexicons and the, you know, the Greek interlinear scriptures, and I would break down every single time the word faith is used in the New Testament and build like a study and an outline and show people 
that faith is a verb actually, like in the way that it's actually applied. And if you and go back to Lordship Salvation, like you mentioned earlier. So I made this video called Faith is a Verb and uh, it, it did well. I, I, you know, I got a couple thousand views. It was like my first video ever on YouTube. And so I was like, okay, this is cool. So I did another one about grace. So what is grace then? Because my, my thinking back then was, I, I really had a distaste for, I guess you could call it once saved, always saved, mainstream, seeker, sensitive doctrines. I really didn't like that. Like, because to me, it was a formula for hypocrisy. I saw so many Christians saying they were Christian and then having nothing Christian about themselves in their actual life, like in their, or their relationship with their spouse or kids or anything. And that irritated me so much because to me, it was so black and white, you know? Um, so I made a video called what is grace. And I was trying to prove to Christians that grace isn't like a big hug you get when, when you're, you know, when God's just forgiving you for stuff and it's grace is like a the power of the Holy spirit to empower you to go and sin no more essentially. So I did the same thing. I broke down grace, Greek, you know, different, looked at all the different commentaries, all the different interpretations of it, compiled it, made a video, the power of grace, and it did well. And so from there, I started to just go down this rabbit hole. I did a whole series called the Fruit of the Spirit series. And I broke down like a 20 minute video on love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Each one of those were videos I made, you know, just like, and it just started taking off. And I, um, I just poured all of my heart and soul and strength into um, doing what I thought God wanted me to do at the time, essentially. Hmm. I've, I've got to say, one of the thoughts that comes to mind is you're telling me those, um, all the ways that you just felt so compelled to, to take this to the next level and to leave your job. I, I'm just imagining in my head people saying, yeah, but Justin, you were never a Christian. And I know I'm jumping ahead <laughs> yeah. a little bit, but like, you just, you know, just thinking what else like what else would you need to prove that you're willing to literally leave your day job to go preach the gospel to the lost and yeah. to be in the word and expound it and anyway um i know we'll probably get to some of that later um no i, I do get that people to this day say oh, well you were never a christian and i'm just like you know i could reply to this and sometimes i do but it's like you have no clue like if you think i was never a christian then you definitely were never a christian because i, I literally started that ministry during a fast, I was fasting to clear brain fog and I was praying on the floor and I feel like the Holy Spirit just gave me this epiphany. I literally felt that way. And I, and I explained it that way for years. Mm -hmm. I said, I was fasting, I was praying and the Holy Spirit was just like, teach. You're a teacher, teach. And I was like, okay, yes, yes, Lord. And I started teaching and that, and I did it nonstop for years after that, <laughs> you know? So mm. yeah, it's funny when they're like, oh, you, you know, no true Scotsman fallacy. You were never a Christian. It's just like, please. Yeah. It's crazy yeah. stuff. Can I ask what, what was the timeline for when you did the, you know, moved on from your job to do this full time and started Christian truthers to, and by the way, is Christian truthers still something that people can access or is that? Uh, no, I changed the name of Christian Truthers YouTube channel to Bullet Holes in the Bible, my current channel. Okay. And when I when I uh, started deconstructing, I took all those videos down. Okay. Gotcha. So, um, yeah. No problem. So, in terms of the timeline, when did you, from when you started that, mm -hmm. when did you get into he the Hebrew roots stuff? And, and like, what what were the seeds that even caught your attention to make you think along the way because my journey like i was in the word and i was exposed to so many different ideas but i i like never ever i, I don't think got tempted by that that route so mm -hmm. i'm really curious like what were the things that pulled you into it and and what were the roadblocks that you were if, if there were any that where you just said ah that's not actually true and then you investigated it and like actually it is true like how did that play out that it just pulled you in and and if you could once you you know share that like what I know you mentioned some of the things with, you know, you're not eating pork and shellfish, but like, how did it, like how radical besides that stuff was the change in terms of your mindset, in terms of if you do this stuff, you're, you're truly pleasing God. And like, what, what would it have been like to not do those things? Like, could you have still been a really good Christian and not do those things? Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, did I believe that it was still, you know, 
you can still be saved without keeping the Torah, basically that type of stuff. Yeah, and just how did you see other Christians at that point? But you know, the first first question: How did you get into it in the first place? Yeah, so I noticed that as I started building studies, um, I I unintentionally became sort of a contrarian, and I got addicted to the feeling of realizing that I was wrong about stuff, and I actually would get really excited and happy when i found out i was wrong about something because to me it felt like this this is god taking me to the next level he's he's uh you know putting me through the furnace of trials and cleansing me of my you know the crap that i'm bringing with me and so I, one of the things that annoy people about me through my career online is that i'm willing to do that and somewhere along the line uh it, it was it was kind of a slow process at first and then and then and then quick but as you i mentioned before i was more of the james 2 style lordship salvation style christian at first like if you're really a christian then you'll have the fruit that follow being a christian if you don't have the fruit that follow being a christian well maybe you're not a christian and so diving into answering the questions what is faith what is grace what is the fruit of the spirit those were all wonderful things but essentially i came to a question <clears throat> what is the law of Christ? Because Paul mentions it. And um, when Paul talked about the law of Christ, see, you see, I was, I was always looking for ways to obey. I wanted to obey and make sure that I wasn't disobeying in any way so that I could please God. And I, again, like I said, I believed that obedience does please God. And I, I think there's a lot of New Testament scriptures to support that idea. And in searching for the law of Christ to try to understand what the law of Christ is, I really couldn't find it. I couldn't figure it out. So I went on this huge like uh, journey of figuring out, well, what is it that we need to do specifically? Like, I want to write a list out so I don't screw this up. You know, what do I need to do specifically to make sure that I'm pleasing God and not irritating him or not, you know, bringing sin into my life? And it, it was in that research that I discovered, well, Jesus... Uh, this is according to my understanding at that time, Jesus kept the Torah perfectly. And again, I don't believe that's true anymore, but at the time I did, he kept the Torah perfectly to become this spotless lamb sacrifice to atone for the sins of the world. So I'm like, okay, so if you follow Christ, if you want to be like Christ, then maybe we should keep the Torah, you know? And then I started looking at the disciples of Christ. I'm like, well, is there any evidence that they were keeping the Torah even after they knew him, right? And I saw lots of evidence of that. Uh, in, in Peter's vision, for example, where he's told to take and eat during that vision, a lot of Christians misinterpret that to think that God's telling them that they can eat whatever they want now. But obviously the, the um, explanation of that vision is in the very next section of scripture. And it says that that's not what it's about at all. It's about the Gentiles now being allowed to come into the, the fold of uh, the brotherhood. So I saw that when 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 um, Peter had that vision, it would have been based on what I was studying at the time. It would have been twenty or thirty years after Christ had ascended. So I'm like, okay, Peter's sitting here saying, you know, and in, in, the, in the vision, God's like, here's a whole blanket full of unclean animals, and he's saying, take, eat, and Peter says, no way, Lord, like never in my life have I put an unclean thing in my mouth, and I said, pause. This is 30 years after Christ left. Why? Why are the disciples still eating clean? And then I noticed the disciples are still going to honor the Shabbat. They're still going to honor the feast days, and they're going to the Jerusalem on feast days. They're still there for the Passover events, etc. So I'm like, okay, why? <laughs> okay, this is getting weird now. How, why do we think that we don't need to keep the Torah? That became my next question. Why do we think that we don't have to keep the Torah, right? And of course, all the answers come from Paul. At the time, I didn't realize that Jesus also is part of that answer, but I, I noticed that Paul's teachings were the most contrary to Torah in my mind at the time. But I did, but I also noticed that Jesus seemed to be saying that we should, uh, like in Matthew chapter five, you know, verse seventeen, not when jot or tittle or no wise pass from the law till all things be fulfilled. Uh, he says, "Verily I say unto you, anyone who teaches." Um, according to the commandments will be greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And those who teach against the commandments will be least in the kingdom of heaven. And not when, you know, not, not when jot or tittle will pass away. So I'm like, okay, Jesus is saying, keep the commandments, <laughs> you know, 
uh, he's keeping the commandments to be this sacrifice. It seems like his disciples are, and now he's telling us to do it. Furthermore, I, I kept looking and I, fought, I saw in Revelation, the last chapter of the book of Revelation, uh, there's a verse that says, um, and depends on what translation you read, but basically says, blessed are they who have their robes washed white, for they will have the right to enter into the kingdom and eat from the tree of life. And so I did a deep study on what does that mean. And one of the translations just tells you straight out. It says, blessed are those who keep the commandments, but they will have the access to the gate of the city and to the tree of life. And so I started doing, a, I did a study on what does it mean to have your robe washed white? And I did, I found out that through scriptural like context and other clues, it means to be uh, righteous. It means to be holy, set apart, to not be you know, entwined with the sinful ways of the world. So I'm like, okay, what is sin? And then John tells us what sin is. Sin is transgression of the law, it says in the book of John. So I'm like, okay, what what law? <laughs> you know, <laughs> what this is, and I was I'm mulling all this over for a period of several weeks and trying to find the answer to this. And at the time, I, I even when I first thought that maybe the Torah or the laws of Moses were the answer, I didn't accept that at first. I'm like, but no, that that's the Old Testament. That can't be, you know, like, isn't that the whole point of the New Testament is like, that's gone. Like, that can't be like, I got to figure out what the laws of Christ really are. That can't be it, you know? Um, but ultimately, I, I in my journey, I was led to a study called the Pauline Paradox by 119 Ministries. And I believe that this is still on YouTube. I know 119 Ministries is still on YouTube. And 119 Ministries is a, a Torah observant Hebrew roots sort of messianic style uh, YouTube channel. They have a lot of followers. I think probably have 200,000 followers or something. I don't know. And they've been running a an active Torah observant ministry for a long time. I want to say going back to 2008 or something. And these are primarily and they non-Jewish. Primarily non-Jewish. Yeah, they're not Jewish. They're not Jewish, no. So when I say Messianic Jewish, I don't really mean Jewish. You know, it's just a, a reference that people can understand. It's really just Hebrew, uh, I'm sorry, Torah observant, um, but not Jewish. No, there's definitely a distinction. Uh, so they had a 12-hour series breaking down the writings of Paul to try and demonstrate how Paul actually also taught to keep the Torah. And that in the cases where it sounds like he's saying that we don't have to or we shouldn't, that we're misunderstanding what he meant. And so I, I studied this whole thing out. I watched all the videos, wrote, took a ton of notes, and went back and cross-checked the references and, and started to see what they were talking about. And I was like, okay, you could make a case that Paul, like 50% of the time, is speaking in on support of the Torah. You know, in the other half, it sounds like he's kind of not, but there's some good explanations for what he probably meant here, right? So... um with that, I was like pretty sold, like maybe we should be keeping the Torah. And I saw that these other big Hebrew roots type ministries existed and that they were thriving and, and they seemed to have all the answers to the questions that I was struggling with for a long time. So finally, it it I want to say it, it sort of came to a head when I saw this documentary called The Way. And um, that documentary has a bunch of different people in it. Um, who are, you know, renowned in the Torah world. One of them is Rob Skiba. I don't know if you've ever heard of Rob Skiba. He's renowned in like the Genesis 6 Watchers Giants research. He also was a big flat earth researcher. He does a lot of like um, sort of, um, he mixes mythology and, and, and kind, of, kind of fictional ideas from apocryphal writings with scripture. But of course, it's very popular. People love that stuff. And he was very, very well known. So, And I knew him by that point, too, because I, I was researching Hebrew cosmology, flat earth, and all that stuff as well. It's probably I just into like, Enoch, too. Oh, yeah. I read all the apocryphal books. I, was, I taught from them, actually. I used to have mm -hmm. readings from these books on my Christian Truthers channel, like narrated readings with pictures and all this like, the stuff you're working on, kind of. Yeah. Um, so, and Rob Skiba was in that the way documentary and that kind of like cemented it for me this is like this one hour thing and it's like this emotionally pressing thing where they just like basically are like look jesus kept the commandments the disciples kept the commandments all the prophets kept the commandments the new testament says to keep the commandments like what are we doing why are we not keeping the commandments you know um so that was it i was like this is it babe like i told my wife i'm like this is it this is it this has to be it i was so excited and i I showed her all the stuff I had been studying. 
of course she was always very good about like i have to decompress at the end of the day i have to like sit down and just talk <laughs> for like an hour after i've been reading all day i think it's part of like just my personality or something adhd or whatever so luckily she's been able to process help me process a lot of my own research and thoughts and in the in the process of doing that she is able to come come along with me like see where i'm at and see what i'm thinking and why and stuff so she was always like right there at my side very supportive and she she decided that she she agrees it makes sense it looks good so we decided we were tour observant and what that meant for us um evolved a little bit but not much but it meant that we realized that we needed to go back and study the torah mm. we need to understand and this by the way that's another big really big part of the pitch of torah observance is what the torah and the old testament in general says about righteousness the old testament says directly uh, the 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 israelites say that keeping torah will be righteousness for us and god says it will be righteousness unto you if you keep my commandments blah 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 so all the way until the new testament is created you have this theme and thread of all the holiest people from abraham to moses to jacob you know david all of them what decided whether or not they were following god or pissing him off it was the torah every single time when they broke the torah and moved away from it god would curse them and you know armies would rise against them and david's son would be killed and all this stuff but when they were keeping it and honoring it, there was peace and strength and honor. And in, in Proverbs, Psalms, Ecclesiastes, all these books say that that's what will happen. It will be a protection to you. It will be your shield. It will be your honor. So it, I guess once you make that switch in that mental mindset and you see all the different Old Testament stuff along with it, you're like, how did I ever? How did anyone ever come to the conclusion that this had to, that this should stop? Since it, since it just it says it's eternal. It says it literally says it's eternal. It says that the fourth, uh, the commandment. I'm sorry about the the Sabbath, is perpetual forever. You know, so I'm like, so why are we intentionally keeping Sabbath on the first day of the week? It just makes no sense, you know. And so, and so then you get into studying how Christianity came to be and where this split even came from. How do we go from keeping Hebrew ideas to keeping Roman ideas? And why do we go from, you know, like torah to something else why we go from the seventh day of the week to the first day of the week and so that led me into a really deep dive of like uh the the way in which the romans um sort of influenced the early christianity but it wasn't until much later that i realized that that has to do with jesus as well i was still in the belief that the messiah jesus christ who we called yahusha of course you know people call him yeshua yahoshua yahawashai but we called him Yahusha, and we actually, well, I should, should have brought it. We actually have a, a book called the Sefer, where it has all the apocryphal books in it. So it has 80 books in it instead of 66. And they, they went through and restored the name of Yahweh in Hebrew in every single instance where it says the Lord, because it originally said Yahweh. So it restored all the names to Hebrew. It restored all the, restored all the biblical names to Hebrew too. So it no longer said Jacob, it said Yaakov, you know. So you start learning how to read and understand the names and the pronunciations and the ways. And you, it really makes you feel like you're connecting with Yahweh on like, on like this ancient, deep, ancient spiritual way that's very personal. Mm. Can I so ask I a, thought, yeah, go ahead. Just want to clarify a couple things. I've seen some Christians who take that the route you're talking about. Mm -hmm. And the next step for them is in many cases to say Paul was a false teacher. Did you get pulled into that at all? Or was Paul yeah, kind of okay for most of it? No, I, I made the, the, my first bombshell video that caused my own following to turn against me was a two-part video series that's actually, I re-uploaded it. It is now still on my channel. Um, it's called 50 Reasons to Never Quote Paul Again. Mm. And so, yes, absolutely. Um, I again it's so so interesting talking about this because yeah paul absolutely taught against the torah like incessantly and when i went back later after i kind of like i stopped giving the credit and respect to bigger channels just because
because they've been in Torah longer than me and stuff. And I started questioning what they were saying. I went back through the Pauline paradox stuff later when I started questioning Paul to see like, how can they say this guy's a good guy? He's clearly not based if, if you know the Torah. I, I started realizing that some of their arguments were flawed and uh, their arguments, especially against uh, Paul. Oh, Paul wasn't saying that it doesn't matter what day you keep the Sabbath. He was saying this. And it's like, yes, he was. He was clearly saying it doesn't matter what day you keep the Sabbath. Like, so like you, when you go back through and, and that that's, I'm glad you brought that up because that was actually the progression for me was after two years. And by the way, I partnered up with another channel that still exists. They're called Parable of the Vineyard. And uh, the guy that runs that channel, Adam, was my very best friend in the whole world. And I actually convinced him to come into tour with me uh, in 2018. And we taught out of the Torah every Friday night for, I want to say, a year and a half, two years, like straight. Uh, and we'd have 800, 900 people live listening to us do Torah portions, teach from the Torah every single Friday night. And both of our channels were booming. I mean, mm. huge Patreon support. Um, I was doing videos um, about the early church, getting like a million views on them and stuff. Like it was booming. Wow. Um, Can I ask, what, throw one more question? Sure. With, with that whole dynamic, I'd be really curious to hear what did Torah observant Jewish people think about the Gentile Torah observant movement. Did you ever get a sense yeah. or were there ever Jewish people that joined you and said, well, like maybe yeah. Jews who Jewish people culturally, ethnically, but they had become Christians maybe, but had joined you in the Exodus from Christianity uh, in, the, in the purest sense, in the Pauline Christianity, and had moved into this. Like just what did any any Jewish people that you talked to about it, what did they think about it? And did would they do did you get the sense that like true were observant Jewish people like living in Jerusalem, that they would have looked at a movement like that and said, yes, you guys are, you, you, we might have some differences, but you're on the right track. Keep on it. How would they have responded? All right. So the first question is like people who kind of are culturally Jewish, but became Christian and then joined the Hebrew roots type stuff. So yeah. most of us believed, and they, and they still do, that the Jewish people living today are con artists. And there's a lot of anti-Semitism involved in this, believe it or not. So, uh, and there's a lot of reasons for that, both, well, mostly scripturally, but also in terms of like literal American, not American history, but world history, how things happened, et cetera. But um, most, most people would say in the Hebrew roots movement that today's Jews are a facade. They're not really of the tribe of Judah. They... Um, you know, you get the, the term fake, you know, whatever. I don't want to like say it and get you demonetized, but um, the Bible mentions them in, in, in their mind. It says that there's fake ones. Um, so the, the ideas behind modern day Hebrew roots movement are that the Jewish people have a, they have their, they have their, uh, what's it called? Midrash, the Talmud, the Kabbalah. They have a bunch of additional texts and additional beliefs. And the Hebrew roots people of today think Jesus was calling them out for that in the Gospels. That they weren't keeping the Torah with, with clean hearts and clean hands, but they were actually adding to the laws and taking away from the laws and things like that. And you see Jesus kind of get on to them for that at one or two points. Like, that you get, you know, you guys nullify the laws of God. When they got mad at him for not washing his hands, he got mad at them for not killing their kids. It's actually kind of funny, but um, so you see this kind of argument happening where so so today's Hebrews will say, yeah, Yahusha, he didn't like all this extra crap, all this magical Kabbalah Talmud, you know, commentary midrash crap that they're adding on top. They're adding these excessive laws that are way too burdensome you can't flip a light switch on on shabbat like that type of stuff jesus hated that we hate that that's not from the old testament it's not from deuteronomy leviticus you know whatever and so it's not holy it's not good and a lot of these people also believe that the jews of today are actually from poland and from other area ashkenazi jews especially are from other areas of europe and they were actually um they were actually converted they were not cult, they're not technically 
of the bloodline of the tribe of Judah, but they were converted to Judaism by other cultures in the past. And there is some truth to that. Um, not just to that one last thing I said. <laughs> um, so today's Jews who become Christian, who become Hebrew roots, will will affirm that. They'll be like, yeah, when I was Jewish, we did all this stupid stuff that's not even in the Bible. It's such crap. God hates it. Those Jews are fake Jews, like whatever. So the other thing is th there's always confusion around what Jews are because, you know, Christians in general, predominantly mainstream sort of like less involved Christians think that Jews mean Israelites. I think it's like synonymous. And to the Hebrew roots crowd is not synonymous at all. And there's a very big difference. And that's when it needs to be known, you know, Jews um, today are like, we just think of them as people who are from Israel or from the, the Jewish or the tribe of, or the, the city of Jerusalem or whatever. But originally it came from the tribe of Judah. And so we always try to make clear, like, look, there's 11 other tribes of, of real, genuine, actual Israelites. And in the Old Testament, it says that those tribes will be scattered among the nations. Moloha Goyim, which means Gentiles of the world. And you see the scattering of the Gentiles all over the world in more than one instance in the Old Testament where they're carried away and scattered by the Assyrians and Babylonians, etc. And so what it's it's kind of I could go on for, about this for a long time, but a lot of the Jews today, some Jews today will are okay with Hebrew roots people doing what they're doing. And they believe, yeah, the Jews, the tribe of Judah has assembled here in the promised land. And the rest of the nations are going to be brought back according to prophecy, because there is prophecy saying that he will bring them from the four corners and all this stuff and lead them back to uh, the, their homeland. They believe that that's going to happen eventually. And that's when the rest of us who are scattered among the nations, who are truly also of the potentially even of the bloodline of legitimate Israelites, will be brought back uh, to join back up with them. But most Jews don't say that, would not agree with that. Most Jews think that goy, uh, goyim, uh, Gentiles like us, should not do that. They should not try and do the Passover and the feast days by themselves. They should not be wearing seat and growing their beards out and doing all this stuff. They believe that, mo and this isn't all of them, by the way, that, the Jewish Judaism is so nuanced too that most people don't realize that like they don't even all agree with each other just like Christians don't, but they're just a lot cooler with each other about it. You know, they're just like more like flippant, like that's cool. This rabbi thinks that that one thinks that we don't need to go to war in Christianity. We start two denominations and they fight each other. Um, so it's it's very nuanced. It's not always one thing, but I'd say most of the Jews that I've met that are legitimate Jews who take it seriously, you know, they don't. They don't think we should be doing this. They think we should be uh, uh, taking a promise to follow the Noahide laws, the Noahide covenant, which is only just a few of the the laws, and that we shouldn't concern ourselves with everything else, the clean eating and the you know, circumcision and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. I've got to say, it's, it's amazing it's all the different ways people slice and dice it and like you said some people are going to be really upset and some people are going to say oh whatever just live in the live but yeah. it's it's so amazing and, and i mean it from this perspective like when you deconvert whether you're looking at hebrew roots or you're looking at you know all the different you know theologies and denominations of christianity it's like none of it matters like none mm -hmm. of it's ever ever mattered for one minute it's got nothing to do with reality it's just man-made systems and constructs and it's it's so crazy like when you truly get out of it and step back and, and look at yourself uh, your past self and then these systems it's it's staggering to me just all the ways we've come up with to kind of just keep ourselves busy with what dead people wrote thousands of years ago it's like, <laughs> yeah. it has nothing to do with real life it never did so and true it's so crazy it just it, it, stuff like that just blows me away but anyway um <laughs> As you're as you're um, wrapping up the part about Hebrew roots, I did want to ask too. I know that you've obviously shifted gears tremendously. So you you sound like you were very much on fire for both you know the Lord in general, your mm -hmm. whole life, but also on fire for your pursuit of truth and the Hebrew roots movement. Like, what were some of the early uh, hints and cracks in the in the wall of the dam that kind of made you question 
because it sounds like you were already questioning so, so much. You were mm -hmm. just constantly saying, like you said, am I wrong about this? Oh, great. I was wrong. Let me, let me pursue the truth. Mm -hmm. Like that mindset is so admirable in, in general, mm -hmm. but obviously, mm -hmm. you know, it's still a big shift to go from mm -hmm. my Christianity wasn't quite right. I didn't understand this verse correctly to this whole worldview is actually false. Like what were the early things that started to make you think about that? Yeah, good question. So, you know, it's funny because when I was still, before I even went into Torah, um, and especially after, but even before I went in, I would do uh, lectures and teachings and articles about how the Bible has been corrupted and Christians would be okay with that. And I was okay, I was okay with that, you know? Um, for example, the Westcott Hort Revision of 1881, just in that one instance, they ripped out 14 books. They removed a ton of different lines of scripture that were there and that aren't there anymore. And they even added in English lines that aren't supported by Greek texts. Like, thus Jesus declared all foods clean in parentheses. That's nowhere in any Greek text anywhere. They just mm -hmm. made that crap up. So you see, and you can actually pull up a website and show all the side by side, like all the stuff they pulled out. It's thousands of verses they pulled out just in 1881. It wasn't even that long ago. And so Christians would say, yeah, that's, you know, it's up to us to, to find the truth, to know the truth, despite man's attempts at screwing up our Bible or whatever. But it's funny to me because we don't come to this conclusion of, well, if God's not protecting his Bible, then how do we know it's ever been protected? You know, how do we know any of this is true? That should have been the first logical next step. But for us, like I said, we were okay with that. We're comfortable with that. Well, yeah, I know they messed with it and they've met, you know, there's different interpretations and people are wrong, but we are finding the real core truth here, you know? Um, that's a funny so, way to put it. I got to say, that's like such a, almost like put it into a meme. Like they messed it up from 1881 to current day, but you know, from like year 1700 going backwards, it was they fine. were, it was fine. <laughs> like perfectly accurate. I'm sure. <laughs> it's just, it's overwhelming that, yeah, the, 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 the you know, when, when you have um, like a detective, uh, I forget what the technical term is, I should know, but when they pick up like some kind of article, you know, that they put in the plastic bag, they not they're not just, you know, sealing it up for evidence to put in the box and take for forensic analysis, but they're keeping some kind of record as to who had it. Like I, I'm the one that actually picked it up and I gave chain it to custody. this person. Yeah. Chain of custody. And, and it's like that chain of custody for the word of God, quote unquote, is like, we have no idea. The no, chain of custody yeah. is completely absent. It's, it's crazy. crazy. It is. So honestly, like the first thing that really got me <clears throat> was I became so entrenched in the Torah. And I mean, I literally read it day and night because it says to, and I wanted to know like everything David knew, everything Abraham knew, like Abraham. It's funny because this is kind of a side note, but I did a video called before he was Abraham. Maybe I should like re-upload some of my old Christian videos just for fun. But and before he was Abraham, I showed how in the book of Jubilees, which is an apocryphal text, which is extremely interesting if you're into fan fiction like the Bible. Uh, <laughs> it's it's a it's it's really good. But Jubilees, Enoch, and Jasher, these books are really cool. So I took Jubilees and Jasher and I read all about Abraham and those two. And those two books have stories about Abraham that are not in the Bible. Stories about him, uh, you know, destroying his father's idols when he was young. And stories of him um, burning down, like, um, his father's idol house. And supposedly Abraham invented the first, like, uh, plow so they could lay seeds down without the crows coming and flying in. And, and it's just stuff about his childhood that just you don't get anywhere else. So I made a... A, a video called Before He Was Abraham. And it's interesting because in, in um, I think it's the book of Genesis, you see Abraham, it just says out of the blue, just, you know, in the, in the, in the subtext, it'll say like Abraham called by God, you know, and then it'll start, it'll just say, and God called out to Abraham and said like, and I don't remember, I don't remember um, yeah, what exactly. A, leave your, leave your land and go to the land I'll show you. Exactly, exactly. <clears throat> well, in the book of Jubilees and Jasher, if you look at those texts and combine them, you see that Abraham went out after destroying his father's idols and doing all these like righteous acts and not even knowing who Yahweh was yet. 
he just knew that was all bullshit, you know, essentially. He goes out to the desert and under the night sky and he says this huge prayer. And God answers his prayer exactly how Genesis picks up. And that's where it starts. Go to the land I'm showing you, to the land of milk and honey and your whatever. That was actually a response to a prayer Abraham made. That's why it just suddenly. And I'm like, why is this not in the Bible? Like, why does it just, it, it doesn't tar, start talking about Abraham until he's like 99 years old or something. It's so super strange. So mm. anyway, the more I got to know the Torah and Abraham and David and uh, Jacob and all this, like obsessively, the more I realized that Paul cannot possibly be a real prophet. And the reason is, is because in Deuteronomy, I'm not going to go into all this right now, but in Deuteronomy 18 and 13, there's parameters for prophets. Um, if they give you false prophecies, they're not really a prophet. If they tell you to chase after other gods, they're not really a prophet. Things like this. Well, Paul, Paul kind of does both, you know, um, especially in terms of teaching. It says, it says in the, I think it's Deuteronomy 13, it says that if they try and convince you to go after other gods, don't listen to them. Next sentence, you shall keep every commandment. God is testing you, right? So I'm like, enter Paul. <laughs> I'm like, well, okay. I realized if it wasn't for Paul, based on my understanding at the time, there would be zero Christianity as we see it today, right? We would only have stories about Yahusha, Yeshua, Jesus that came from the gospel writers, which I didn't know weren't real at the time either. But, and if we had no Paul at all, this would be so much easier. You know, if you went from Old Testament straight into James, straight into John, straight into, yeah, you know, Hebrews and things, you could find, you could find a way to keep the Torah relevant and Christians would have a better understanding of like, look, Jesus did make the sacrifice and stuff for us, but we still got to keep the commandments, you know? And Paul just ruins everything in my mind at the time. So I, I did a deep dive on Paul and I'm like, I'm going to find all the times that Paul just totally contradicts the Torah, like clearly contradicts the Torah or lies or changes his mind or contradicts himself or is a uh, speaking out of both sides of his mouth. I mean, he says himself, be all things to all people. To a Jew, I act like I'm a Jew. To a Gentile, I act like I'm a Gentile. And I'm like, that's not good. That's she. That's not good moral practice. It's not good ethical practice. If you were an all-powerful apostle of Christ with powers to heal and stuff, then why would you cower from anyone? You should just be who you are all the time. Like, you know, act like a Jew to Jews and act like a Gentile to Gentiles. I'm like, this guy's a piece of crap, man. So I made the video... 50 reasons to never quote Paul again. And I just like tore Paul apart. I was just like, this dude's trash. He he's hates the Torah. He speaks against everything that's good, <laughs> you know? Um, and that's when my community first was just like, like, holy crap, dude. They were on board with me. So long as I didn't take away like Paul and anything in the New Testament, they're okay with understanding that stuff's already been changed in the past and added and whatever, but I'm not allowed to do that. <laughs> so that was the first schism. I lost, a, uh, I started losing some support pretty rapidly, although I did have a surprising number of people who decided that I was right after studying all this stuff. I created a document called the Paul document and I had it hung on my website. And people could download it and read the whole thing. And I mean, I had hundreds of people come to me after reading it and say, I was mad at you, but you're right. Like he contradicts the crap out of it. It doesn't work, you know. Um, can I ask and, one? Yeah. Can I throw in a quick question? Sure. The teacher, the the Dead Sea Scrolls teacher of righteousness uh, mm -hmm. against the liar. Yeah. Did you go down that route at all and investigate if you thought there was any credence to the idea that Paul was the liar or whoever he's? Yeah, whoever definitely. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. That that kind of goes along with. Um, well, that's kind of a separate thing, the Melchizedekian doctrines and all that. That's kind of a separate thing. But yeah, I did. And also, I included Jesus had some words that seemed to warn against Paul as well. Uh, he says to beware of a wolf in sheep's clothing. Well, Paul said he's from the tribe of Benjamin. Their their logo is a wolf. Um, and there's there's a lot of statements like that. And yes, I did. I don't think I included that, though, the um, articles from the, um, the Qumran sect or the Dead Sea Scroll text. I don't think I included that in my thing, but yeah, I, I noticed that people were sending me that kind of stuff all the time. And they're like, yeah, I think it's saying right here that Paul is the deceiver of the end times and all this. And mm -hmm. I'm like, I believe it. I believe it. You know, 
it does just if I could pick back one more thing and then um, give you the floor to, to take us into your deconvergence story. It really does mm-hmm. feel like that issue that this, the generic issue you're talking about of, of what do we do with Paul? How does he fit into this? The whole idea of um, what is it called when you, when you harmonize, you know, mm-hmm. you get these books, you know, the harmony of the gospels was a big deal mm-hmm. for us in Bible college. You know, the, 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 the gospels aren't telling divergent stories. If you put them together in the right way from the right mm-hmm. angle, you know, with the right rose colored glasses on, it actually <laughs> works quite well. And it's beautiful. Um, but the, the bigger, broader harmonization of the old Testament with the new and the parts of the new, especially that are, you know, Pauline uh, and a few other parts, but you know, when you look at Paul, especially this idea of merging him with first the rest of the New Testament and then with the Old Testament, it's number one, you you get the harmonization message so thoroughly, so early in life that you know you're 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 memorizing, of course, the Romans road and mm-hmm. all these great verses, you know, uh, that you you so many verses I memorize as a young child from Paul. Mm-hmm. But then even in the in the New Testament, the order of the books, where it's like, okay, weren't Paul's books written first prim- for at least many of them? So shouldn't he be at the front of the New Testament? But it's kind of shoved in later, and a lot of his theology ends up in the Gospels. So you end by the time you kind of get to Paul, even though he was chronologically earlier, he just feels like he flows with the Gospels in some mm-hmm. ways. He's he's explaining the Gospels, as it were. Mm-hmm. And but as a as a Christian growing up, you just get this sense that Paul does fit like he. You know, he, he's taking, you know, Abraham believed in God and it was credited credited to him as righteousness. Therefore, mm-hmm. we're going to do the same thing. We believe in Christ uh, mm-hmm. as our righteousness and all these things. But when you, when you first, like for the first time in your life, step back and say, actually, there are, there are some serious bullet holes in, in Paul's story. Paul actually doesn't quite fit as smoothly as I first thought he does, does. And then when you look at the actual, like you've mentioned the book of James, but also you look even in uh, Galatians where like they're fighting with each other. Yes. And and in, in the book of Acts, they're fighting with each other. They're antagonistic. And you don't get any sense that the people that were actually with Jesus, if he was a real character, if that the, the people that walked with him and talked with him and ate with him, that, that they're now taking a back seat to this guy that never met him, but mm-hmm. just had the visions. I was like, that doesn't make sense. It mm-hmm. should be that Paul should be the mentor, you know, be mentored by the true mentors, 12. which is the 12 disciples. And that doesn't make sense. Paul's meant, as it were, Paul's mentoring the people that should be mentoring him. It's it's the whole thing is flipped on its head. And mm-hmm. I, I, I wish I had thought of it earlier. I wish somebody had said something earlier. But once, when you get those wheels moving, you're like, and I'm I'm obviously being very generic for the sake of time, but when you actually dig into some of the minute details of this, you're like, this doesn't make sense. Like, why mm-hmm. was Paul should have taken a far back seat to the disciples easily? Big and they time. should have written all the main books of the New Testament. He could have slipped in like one little book, maybe, but mm-hmm. he should have been absolutely the Padawan in this case, you know? Yeah. It's it's funny too that you mentioned the conflict between him and the other twelve. Because that's part of the 50 reasons to never quote Paul again idea. And there's other people on YouTube talking about this too, that are still Christians, but they think Paul is a false apostle. And there's ins- you see where when Paul goes to meet with the 12, um, it, it ends in discord every single time. He goes to Jerusalem. By the way, the other 12 are living in Jerusalem peacefully. No Roman problems, no persecution, nothing bad's happening to them. But Paul visits Rome or Jerusalem to hang out with the 12 for a few days. And first of all, the Holy Spirit inspired 12 disciples of Jesus Christ immediately say, we don't trust that guy. And Barnabas has to go, no, 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 he's cool. He's cool. He's with me or whatever. And they're like, okay, right. And then within a day or two, they're all arguing about stuff. And Paul, Paul gets kicked out of Jerusalem. He, he like had to leave, like flee for his life because they were trying to kill him. Like he, they, act, they, act, they act like he was being persecuted and had to flee Jerusalem. But I'm like, why were the other 12 perfectly okay? And then, you know, like there's, there's a scene where, um, what is it? Paul goes to, uh, oh, I wish I could remember this. Paul goes to rebuke Peter for to eating his face. with, 
with uh, Gentiles and then, yeah, and then changing his mind when the Jews walk up, right? Yeah. But it's funny because in Peter's version of this story, or there's another version of this story where Peter is eating with the Gentiles and the Jews walk up and Peter stands up to the Jews to their face. And he said, look, this, he's, Peter says, God showed me a vision. And in this vision, he showed me that Gentiles are now clean. It goes along with his narrative, right? And based on that, like we should be eating with them and we shouldn't call unclean what's clean now. And the Jews are like, oh, okay, thanks, Peter. And that's Peter's version of the story. Paul's version is he rebuked Peter to his face because he was such a hypocrite and he wouldn't stand up for him for himself and, and to the Jews because he stopped eating with the, the goyim when the Jews came around and all this stuff. And I'm like, what, what is this? Is this there's, there's so much conflict. And some people have even laid the book of James side by side with Galatians. And when you do that, you can see an argument happening. It's like, it's like Paul wrote something and James is like arguing back against him. It almost seems that way. Yeah. But yeah. And so, even if like with, uh, I was going to say with yeah. Paul's story where he says, he keeps on adding it like a badge of honor. Like I didn't go spend time with the disciples too much. I went out in the desert for a couple of years and like, I, I didn't get my message from them. I'm like when you step back from like, that's not a badge of honor. That's a badge of arrogance. If you mm -hmm. truly want to, to know Jesus, sit at the feet of the people who actually know Jesus. Right. Um, like this, saying i don't care about these great disciples and they're not that important to me in terms of my mentorship and my learning who who jesus really was mm -hmm. you've just disqualified yourself you've made yourself look like someone who's trying to jump to the head of the class without doing any homework and it's like he, this is yeah. this isn't right this doesn't he, make any sense you're absolutely right and he even makes fun of them he calls them yeah. super apostles that as they seem to be uh, the pillars that they're su su supposedly are like he like says things about them that's so condescending um yeah but it, but going also into the thing you said about the chronology that is such a huge piece of this for me and and as part of my deconstruction actually is the chronology of how the new testament was written and who wrote what first and that's so big that i actually had dr richard carrier come on my channel and if you go to Bullet Holes in the Bible, my YouTube channel, the top pinned video right now is called uh, Dr. Carrier Talks Jesus from Outer Space. And of course, Jesus from Outer Space is an excellent breakdown. It's a book that he wrote about you know, why he thinks Jesus is more likely a mythological figure than a real historical person. And of course, just because if Dr. Carrier was here, he'd want me to say this. He has a much thicker uh, peer-reviewed scholarly book called on the historicity of jesus and it's the only peer-reviewed uh book on a mythological mythical jesus that has passed peer review um and jesus from outer Sp yep there here, we'll, we'll do a little plug for him here <laughs> i love that yeah he's such a good guy too I, I i'm lucky enough to get to talk to him back and forth a little bit here and there the jesus from outer space is sort of a summarization of that book with you know there's still sources and still excellent stuff, but it's easier to read, I think, for people who are new to this whole topic. And that's why I wanted him to address that book on my channel was because I just think it's so important if Christians could understand how scholarship works and how um, how the Bible was laid out chronologically, it would really start to pull on that thre thread on the sweater, you know? Realizing that Paul was the first person to ever write about the New Testament version of Jesus Christ that we have today in Christianity. And well, of the books available in the New Testament that we currently have, Paul was the first one to write about Jesus. And really interestingly, Paul's version of Jesus isn't a physical ma man walking around. Paul doesn't mention a virgin birth or eating with the 12 or doing miracles. Paul doesn't mention any of that stuff. Paul's version of Jesus is an apparition that comes and shows himself, reveals himself to people. And Paul seems to even think that that's how the other 12 experienced Jesus. He doesn't mention that they specifically were like hanging out and, you know, um, so Paul's version of, of Jesus not only was sort of like this supernatural, like ghost visionary angel thing, but also when Paul does reference Jesus's sacrifice, he talks about it being in the heavens. You know, 
he talks about all this stuff happening in the heavens, like as above, so below type stuff, like uh, Ephesians 6, 12, where we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, right? Uh, spiritual forces in high places and all this stuff. Paul's version of the gospel is like, this is all like invisible. This is all happening in the heavens and in your heart type stuff. And so, and of course, Paul never met Jesus himself either. He just, he only saw him through a vision. So when you realize that Paul was the first person to lay this idea out, and then the gospels came later after to euhemorize or historicize or put into history a figure of Jesus who was a man who actually lived and walked around in Jerusalem, it really, it really, it really shakes things up because you can see that like as a standard, and Dr. Carrier talks about this extensively on my on my video, but as a standard in his books, of course, as a standard, mythological figures are historicized after more commonly than vice versa. So it's more common for someone who never existed at all, for someone to write about them as if they did really exist, really were born, really lived over there. That's more common than than people really existing and then someone making them into a god later. And that, that's even what happened with Osiris. People thought Osiris was a real person, a real king that ruled and reigned in Egypt for all this time. And then, of course, we realized he wasn't. That was the same, same thing, the same process by which, as a standard, humans love to take mythical figures like Achilles or whoever and say, oh, no, but they were real. They really lived there in Troy and did this, fought this battle and did this thing. But that never happened. And we know that that doesn't happen. And we know that that's the standard of literature from what we can tell. So I don't know. It just really, really unlocked a lot for me when I realized that Paul sort of was the first one to sort of make this up. And it wasn't completely made up out of thin air either. And that's the other thing that I wish people could grasp is the Hellenization period, how the Jewish people were strongly influenced by Greco-Roman ideals during that period the other dying and rising sun gods, the other mystery cults that were all prevalent. When, and when you, if, if we could all absorb the knowledge of uh, the early, you know, uh, intellectual Jewish and Greco-Roman people of that area in the first century, if we knew the things they knew, then we would see that this, this version of Jesus that popped up was just not really different from everything else that they were already saying about other people, you know, it's frustrating to see because it's, it's um, people think that the ideas of Jesus uh, that Paul wrote about and in the Gospels are like new, you know, like it's this new idea. And that's why it's such a good idea. But it's like, well, if you realize it's not a new idea, then you realize it's not such a good idea. <laughs> you know? Yeah, exactly. It's got a few nuances that are new for from because it comes come from a very Jewish perspective, um, new right. compared to Greco Roman. But yeah, it's, it's, and so much is literally like one for one copied i don't mean necessarily every time word for word but just the mm -hmm. um you know where they're they're taking ideas straight out of plato and they're just taking ideas straight out of um you know the dionysius stories and so forth which you touch on so so well you know they're just they're taking so many of the motifs and the stories and they're rewriting them and it, like you said if you knew those stories if they mm -hmm. were just part of your psyche just like for us um maybe not i was gonna say star wars but there's so many new star wars out there but you know the the for the last like 15 20 years that the original star wars where just everybody knew them and that mm -hmm. was the only star wars you had um it's like it was so woven into our culture and so you could you could talk about making references to lightsabers and, and you everyone would know a red red lightsaber means the bad guy mm -hmm. and a green or blue one means the good guy right. and you know it could make all these references to things from those movies and nobody would be surprised if you made up another story that kind of touched on them and you'd know exactly, Oh, I see what you're doing there. Mm -hmm, exactly. Um, but, but we lose it. And, and I love that the great work by Dennis McDonald is of course, of course, in bringing some of this stuff back to our, you know, front and center, but like you have to, if you want to inter and if, it's funny, if I say what I'm going to say in church, we heard so much, you have to have the context, right? You have to get the context. You can't just pull stuff out. You can't just, Open your Bible. Oh, that's God's message for me today. That's mm -hmm. not how it works. Learn the context, the historical literary context. Well, the context of the whole New Testament is like you said, it's a Greco-Roman world. Mm -hmm. And of course, with the, you know, the Jewish background as well. And, and more than that, even um, going into Sumerian mythology and Egyptian mythology, mm -hmm. 
there's and, and even you know argue, I, I've seen some good arguments that there's some Buddhist mythology and even hints of Mithraism woven in. Like you have to know the full background, but if you did know it, and then and you didn't have any exposure to Christianity yet, if you knew all those stories really well, and then you saw the Christianity story that did come much later, you would be like, oh snap! Like that's not what I thought it was. This yeah. is it's new, but it's a it's a it's a new retelling, a new rehashing. Of mm-hmm. these old motifs, and right, you know, are, are maybe in some ways arguably better than some of them, but right. it's still just it. It's a, it's a story. It's mythology, and there's mm-hmm. nothing wrong with thinking it's a cool story. I, I love yeah. how as, as we evolve from our worldview, we go back to the Bible and think, this is really, really, really cool stuff. But I'm seeing it with new eyes when you weave in the Old Testament typology, you weave in the Greco-Roman stuff, all these other um, stuff from the Homeric epics. And the 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 gods of the day, the mystery cults. But then you weave in astro theology. You weave in lots of cool stuff with gematria and numerology. You're like, these guys are not stupid. They knew some crazy cool stuff to do this. And arguably, I think there was probably multiple rehashings where somebody you know told the story, then someone else went back and added their expertise. Maybe someone with gematria said, I can weave some really cool stuff in here. Let me have my shot at it. But when you when you get it all done, it's like this is a really cool book, but it's just mythology. And it honestly breaks my heart that so many of our friends and colleagues and, and loved ones, they don't even get one percent of the information to be able to understand where this thing even came from. You know what I mean? Yep. Yeah, totally, totally. I, I said recently, like I came to the conclusion that I think most of the early followers of Christianity would have certainly known that it's not actually real. Like uh, at least the leaders and stuff, you know, mm-hmm. that because they're, yeah. because like you said, they're educated. They're like, they knew cults, mystery cults weren't really like tangibly, physically real. The stories are meant to teach us something or tell us a secret, but not literally happening. And yeah, context far removed 2000 years later, we think these things literally happened and that's the somehow the lesson and the real lesson is completely lost. Because like you said, yeah. context doesn't doesn't exist. And in that sense, they're truly like current day Christianity. While they would proclaim Christ as the most important person in their life, they're not actually following the original Jesus in terms of, you know, would whoever, wh- whether there was a real guy or uh, that was originally, you know, the basis for this, or if it was just a literary character from the beginning, whatever that first generation or two really did to create the Jesus character current Christianity has almost nothing to do with it. And so like, you're not actually a true Christian. Mm -hmm. If a true Christian is like the first Christians, you have nothing to do with them. You really don't. It's crazy to think about. Exactly. So true. So true, man. Yeah. So I think that unraveling Paul was the first step to my deconversion. And um, from there, you know, I was challenged by some of the other religious leaders in the Torah movement. They said, if you remove Paul, then you're eventually going to have to remove the entire New Testament. And then eventually you're going to remove the entire Bible, and then you won't even be a Christian anymore. Mm. And I felt personally challenged by that. I was like, that's not true. You can have a New Testament gospel, and you can have Jesus, and it all fits without Paul. You don't need him, you know? And um, first of all, I just want to say before I go any further on that, the mentality for me was um, the outcomes are irrelevant. Like the implications of a truth being true or not, the implications of how that will affect us in the future for, for intellectual honesty to exist. I think those implications must be ignored because otherwise we're making decisions on what will fit easier and won't fit very easily into like our worldview. So I was told all the time, like, well, if you get rid of Paul, then you're going to lose this other thing. And I'm just like, so be it. So be it, man. Like if, if that's what happens and that's what happens, because I know that Paul can't fit, you know, and you're telling me, and they admitted to this over and over that they'd rather just say, like, overlook the issues with Paul, gloss it over, but find other ways to try and make it work. Because if we don't do that, the implications are so heavy. And I was just like, implications can suck it we need to follow this road to where it goes and find out right 
So I wrote a series called The Messiah Complex. And in that series, um, I was defending the I was defending the fact that the Messiah, as as talked about in the New Testament without Paul, could be I guess congruent could could be fluidly fit into the narrative of the Old Testament. If Jesus were to arrive as a real human man, like all the other prophets did. And so for a while, by the way, I was, I considered myself an Ebionite. The Ebionites didn't think that Jesus was actually like an angel or anything. They thought he was a regular man who was born and he was endowed with the spirit and with a ministry at his baptism by John the Baptist. They don't think he was born of a virgin. Um, so that, that's kind of where I was at. I was like, well, if, if this is still going to work, then we have to take out all the magic and we have to, we have to, we have to say that he would have been more like a real standard prophet, right? So let's say he's a standard prophet. He came like John the Baptist, like Elijah, like everyone else. He kept the Torah. God thought he was a good guy because of it. So at his baptism, he declared him the son of God, which is a title, not a, a real thing, a physical thing. And maybe from there, like, uh, God empowered him to do miracles and stuff. Like we see prophets calling down fire from heaven and turning snakes into sticks and vice versa. Maybe God gave him that power for his ministry stereo purposes. So he could become the new high priest of a new era and blah, blah, blah. So let's, let's make that work. Let's write that study and, and see how we can make this happen. So in the process of doing this, I wanted to end, I wanted to end my study with like a bombshell argument about the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. And I had this book from Sefer Publishing, uh, I believe, and it was like 114 prophecies fulfilled by Jesus. And I'm like, I'm going to take this book and I'm going to slap it down and I'm going to show everyone that for all the reasons I already described in my article series, and now this too, that Jesus is perfectly fine without Paul. If it's in the Old Testament, perfectly fine. It can work. You just got to drop all the crap you think you know about Jesus from Paul. It was during that series, I started to realize, as I was going through these prophecies, I would like read one and I'd be like, oh, that's kind of weak. I can see how it'd be easy to argue against this one. Let me find a better one. And I'd read that one. And I'd be like, oh, that's kind of weak too. Like, I know there's better ones than this. Come on. And I would like go through this thing. And when I found what I thought were like maybe the, the top 20 prophecies that were fulfilled by Jesus. And it's pretty easy. Like in my mind, I thought it'd be easy to argue that he fulfilled these prophecies, which makes him, you know, it connects him back to the Hebrew scriptures. I said, well, let me go find what, what the arguments are against this. Cause I cannot honestly ever make a study unless I hear the argument against it. So I went and I found a guy named Tovia Singer. You know who that is? Oh yeah, very much. I love Tovia Singer. He saved my life. I want to have him on one day because he's such a great dude. So smart. Um, Tobias Singer explained one by one by one by one why none of those prophecies have anything to do with Jesus. And I started to realize that, you know, this Christian idea of this prophetic cycle, or I call it a prophecy cycle. Christians think, uh, like, let's say an Old Testament prophet will make a prophecy about some minor tangible physical thing. And that minor tangible physical thing will actually come to pass in the prophet's day. But the whole prophecy is also a representation of a greater end times prophecy that's hidden. And all of these things are code words for a bigger fulfilling of this prophecy that's to come, like a prophecy cycle. Like There's like the shadow of things to come, you know? The Old Testament was this like physical, lowly, stupid, like front brain prophecy. And now we got this huge, big, spiritual, like metaphysical prophecy that's coming. And that's what the prophet really meant. And Tovia just has a way of taking it back and being like, no, it's not. That's not what he really meant. Right here, this is what the prophet meant. And this is where it was fulfilled right here, you know. And at one by one by one, I just started realizing that like, that's not a good argument. That's not a good argument from, from me from my prophecy book, I realized one by one by one that I don't have anything. Like there's, I could, I could make a case. I could argue back. I could try and find a way to make it work. But my confidence in the truth of it started to fade. 
And I started to say, well, maybe I'm like wrong, dude, like for real, because I thought this stuff was solid and it's just really not, you know? And once, uh, once I came to the conclusion that Jesus didn't, I can't prove that Jesus fulfilled any of those prophecies. And I started to see the Jewish perspective, like the real Jewish perspective, not the Hebrew roots version of it. I was like, yeah, Toby is right, dude. J Jesus could have never, ever, ever, ever been a sacrificial atonement sacrifice for Israel. Like it never could have happened. He's not a female lamb, you know, he's even he's not even a male lamb. He's not a lamb. He's a human being. God detests the, abomin the abomination of human sacrifice in two places in the Old Testament. I mean, it's just so many things wrong. If you know the Torah, you know, it just kind of took, it took a Jew actually to give me that final perspective to where I was just like, oh, dang, man, this is total bull crap, bro. Like this is, this is over. Mm. I'm screwed. Like, um, so That's I sat amazing. on that. I sat on it for a while. I like, um, I, I stopped trying to write my Messiah complex article thing. I started to like, just listen for a couple of weeks, just listening to, um, agnostic atheists, counter apologists, like all this stuff, you know, the stuff I'm involved in now, I started listening to that and it just hit me, you know, I, I it wasn't like this one big thing. It was kind of a progression of things. I was like, this is all fake, isn't it? You know, and my wife's like, yeah, I think it is. <laughs> you know? So from there, I just jumped straight to, I didn't just discard the New Testament. I, you know, again, and I also read, uh, you know, um, Creating Christ and um, the Caesar's Messiah. Watch that video. And I started getting into this like first century history from the perspective of secular scholars instead of from the perspective of Christian scholars. And it just it just became clear. I just realized I, I don't know, it was like this huge relief almost for me. I was like, wow, this is fake. This is all fake. And from there I, I looked at the Old Testament. I and I just went straight to the very beginning and I'm like, where does Yahweh come from? And I started studying the Phoenician Canaanite connection to Yahweh and Asherah and their whole pantheon of gods and where all this you know, blood cult stuff came from before Yahweh even existed, you know, where they were sacrificing animals in the Near East before the Egyptian or the Israelites were even a thing. They were already sacrificing gods to Baal and all these other. Uh, so, yep, I just, just I just threw the whole thing out. I'm like, yep, it's all fake. I'm going to proceed from here as if everything is fake until someone can prove to me any of it's not. I just switched my bias like completely over. And that was probably two years ago. And ever since then, I've been making little studies here and there to show some of the Christians who follow me still, and maybe some that are in the process of deconstructing, all the different, in my opinion, like really strong pieces of evidence and arguments for the New Testament, especially being completely fiction. And some of those mm -hmm. you kind of mentioned, I love Dr. Dennis McDonald so much. I made a video called Mimesis and Mark. And it's a study based on the work he did showing the um, the uh, the comparison between the writings of, um, where did it come from? I, I can't think about Homer's, the top of my Homer's head. Odyssey and Homer's Drippy's Odyssey. Bacchae, Drippy's yes. Bacchae and Mostly the Homer's Odyssey. Yeah. It, it's, it's the, um, you know what Mim Mimesis criticism is, of course, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So it's, you know, just showing the sequential and ordered and repetitive like markers and anti-markers, so to speak. So I made a video called Mimesis and Mark where I think it proves, in my opinion, it's like so obvious, but for some people they watch it and they don't get it. But to me, it's so obvious that Homer's writings were the template for creating the gospel of Mark, which was the first gospel. So that, that, that alone just throws all the gospels out the window because the rest of the gospels came to piggyback off of in my opinion, off of Mark to add to it. And then I have that Paul versus Plato video where I show line by line, side by side with sources. Um, all the times Paul copied Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, Seneca, and many others. And that's so problematic because Paul says himself over and over at least four times that he didn't get his doctrines from man. He's not going to teach you vain philosophy of mankind. He's Everything he got was from Jesus Christ himself, 
but then he goes and just quotes man's philosophies incessantly, you know? <laughs> so it's like, to me, those things are just, they're just coffin nails. Like he's a liar, you know? Mark was based off Homer. Paul was based off of Plato. And then Jesus, in my opinion, is very strongly based off Dionysus and many others, of course. But I made a video called Jesus is Dionysus because I think the comparisons are very, very, like, very clear, you know? So, yeah, it's huge. yeah and that, I just kept going, making documentaries, and I've been building on that ever since. And that's how I got to where I am today, really. Mm, I love it. Uh, just to uh, mention a couple of the resources that are very similar, if anyone you may know some of these, but um, the uh, video, Seeing Through Christianity, I forget um, the guy's name, I should know it, but um, Seeing Through Christianity, I have the link for it beneath our video. Great, great video where he talks about the evolution of the Yahweh character and so forth. Uh, of course, lots of stuff from Dr. Carrier, but um, seeing through Christianity is more like a broad overview, but you get that sense that like Yahweh didn't start as Yahweh. He started, you know, as like a, the son of Elyon and, and Asherah, and then they, they, you know, merged it all. And another great uh, resource, uh, the YouTube channel Truth Surge, if you know Truth Surge, he did something very similar where he went like s just step by step by step through the Odyssey based on Dr. McDonald's work, but he just kind of takes it super slow and like talks it through with you. And says, would this make sense? Would that make sense? Why would he do this? And you get it by the time you're done, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is clearly a rewrite. I mean, it's it's beautiful. It, it becomes more beautiful, but it becomes a rewrite of mythology. And I, th I think I was just going to add something too to what you said about when you're deconstructing Paul, but Jesus is still there. It's really interesting to me how, and, and I'm sure I did this too, there's just part of us that doesn't piece together not just the mythology aspect of it, but just the right questions. Because it's, it's like, if you if you can deconstruct Paul, then you really kind of have to say, well, like you went to at the end, you have to deconstruct Yahweh. Because Yahweh, you know, Paul's an evolution of the Paul, of the Yahweh story. But it's like, we don't, we're like, we want, we want to keep, we want to get rid of Paul, but keep Jesus and, and Yahweh. And then we want to get rid of Jesus, but Yahweh's still there. It's, you know, tour observance, you know, there, there's got to be something at the core of this. If nothing else, even if Jesus was just a guy, just a man, just a good prophet, he just, like every other prophet, he just said, go back to the word of God and obey it. Even if it was that good, we're still basing this whole thing on, yeah, but Yahweh. Yahweh is where this whole thing starts and ends. And we just keep on not questioning the origins of Yahweh. And But once you realize, really deconstruct Yahweh's origins, and in many ways, that was kind of, for me, the crux of my deconversion is like, once that crumbles, any anything else that came after it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter mm -hmm. what Jesus or Paul said. If Yahweh's a nobody, then everything else is, is just, at, you know, it's just people chattering about their ideas about mythology. And it's it's a such a journey. I did want to ask, though, um, I know we've gone through a lot here, and I'll try to wrap this up shortly, but as you're going through that, I know you're talking about it matter-of-factly, like this happened, and this happened, and this happened. but you know, when you, and you're, you're obviously truly proclaiming, I want the truth more than my current, you know, worldview, my current status quo. I want the truth first, which is awesome. But there's these implications along the way of like, if this crumbles, if Paul's gone, I'm, I'm okay. Jesus is gone. I'm probably, I've got Yahweh, but once Yahweh leaves, it's like, there's, there's nothing left. Your whole world has really shattered in some ways. How did you emotionally, I mean, having already gone through so much emotionally with with your, you know, your military career and all that, how did you deal with the emotions yet again of this, uh, I mean, arguably another huge tra trauma of realizing not just that your life's been difficult, but that your worldview has been false? Like, what were the processes of it? And what, especially when you look at the afterlife? Mm. Yeah, so I, I became... At first, I became really excited and happy because I felt like I figured something out that I've been trying to figure out for a very long time. But then I became kind of sad um, because I felt like I wasted a lot of my life on this and that everyone I knew had wasted a lot of their life on this and still were. And ultimately, I realized right away, and I think I'm just so thankful for this, I realized right away that I needed a new worldview immediately. I needed to examine what morality is without any biblical interruption. And um, I needed to figure out like what's right and wrong based on 
what I think is right and wrong and not based on what the Bible says is right and wrong. And so honestly, because I knew that I was, I knew I was confused. I knew that I needed um, help. So I got counseling right away. Um, And in that counseling, it's very interesting because initially I went to counseling because I realized quickly I needed to learn uh, self-care and self-love and um, and just things like that. But through that counseling, I also realized very quickly that I had like a ton of symptoms of being narcissistically abused my whole life. And I didn't even know what that was. I didn't know what MPD was or narcissistic personality disorder. I didn't know how people acted when they had been abused by narcissists. I didn't, I didn't realize that I was like the mascot for it, uh, for, for what happens when you're abused by narcissists. <laughs> But essentially through that process, it's weird because I went from being so focused on this, like to me, theology was my whole world. And when Yahweh disappeared, I was able to like zoom out in a way that I'd never had before and realize that Yahweh is not the whole world and the Bible is not the whole world. And I was able to like look back farther at my myself from, a, I guess, from a more... A, objective perspective or trying to look at myself from a more objective perspective as a human who's just experiencing life on this earth, you know? And, um, but through, through my counseling, I realized that I needed to start studying uh, narcissistic personality disorder and what it means to be a highly sensitive person, what it means to be an empath, what it means to be, uh, to, to, to build, uh, boundaries in relationships so that you're not continuously used and walked on by narcissistic people. And so through that process of healing, I disconnected from my parents. I disconnected from some of my friends, even the ones, some of the ones that I had left. But ultimately I, I also learned that Yahweh was a narcissist. That was like, and I, that was a sort of an unintentional thing to learn, like from reading all these books about how maternal narcissism affects you as a child, like reading a whole book about that and then coming away from it like, wow, Yahweh is totally screwing everyone over. Um, so um, I I did a little bit of Dr. Richard Carey, again, I hate bringing him up so many times, but he has a book called Sensing Goodness Without God, and he helps build a, a worldview. He helps te- teach you how to build your own worldview. And um, I didn't read the whole book, but I did. Um, I have per- perused it a little bit. But I knew it was important for me to decide on my own what's what's ethical, what's moral, what's valuable, and what's my identity. Because Christianity is an identity. And when you leave Christianity, you, you could go through identity crisis or another whole existential crisis from there. And I wanted to avoid, I wanted to avoid that because I've done that so many times in my life. Um, and I studied, it's funny, the first thing I did is I went and studied Tao in Zen. And I wanted to, I think I did that because as coping mechanisms uh, for healing, I was focusing on being mindful and learning how to be present minded and uh, learning how to meditate and how to basically like uh, let things go. Because I was very upset about my whole life (laughs) being wasted and lied to and all this in the art of learning about letting things go and how to find peace and being mindful, I also learned a lot about ethics that I never really considered. And so my wife and I put together a list of 12 rules for life. And I wish I had them on me right now. Um, And one of them is to not, for example, one of them is to not strive against nature. And this is from Lao Tzu, who uh, wrote the Tao Te Ching, I think. Um, not to strive against nature. Another one is to we we wrote is to not have empathy for people who do not have empathy, because if you do, you'll get used and abused over and over and over and over again. So and like even that simple rule, for example, not having empathy for someone who doesn't have empathy means I shouldn't have any empathy for God, for Yahweh, or any of the fictional characters of the Old Testament because they don't they don't really have any for for us. But it also teaches you how to like set boundaries with people in your life who just continuously use and abuse you, which I'm, I'm, I'm an overcommitter. People are like, Hey, can you help me move tomorrow? And I'm like, of course. 
And I, I already told eight other people I'd help them move tomorrow. And I just completely forget about that. I just like, yeah, I'll do it. Yeah, I'll do it. Y'all yeah, do it. And um, so I had to learn how to just be like, no, I have to like sleep and take care of myself and eat and protect myself and protect and value my own time and value my my present life with my family and things like that. So I, I think that I'm still in the process of dealing with some of the existentialism that I've always dealt with because I went from having this massive purpose being a combat Marine to having this massive purpose of being an evangelist to having a, a purpose now of helping Christians leave Christianity and hopefully get mental health assistance and help them develop worldviews and help them realize that like, look, leaving, leaving God doesn't mean, doesn't have anything to do with Satanism or eating babies or drinking blood. Like, Literally nothing about my life has changed since leaving Christianity, except I don't waste as much time. I still, actually, I still read the Bible so much to, for counter apologetics. Actually, it's kind of funny, but like, I'm still the same old G. Like all my friends and family who are close to me still think I'm a swell guy who tries to follow the rules and tries to do what's right by people, and has a lot of empathy for, for people and animals, and tries to be responsible with my money. You know, like I, I I've seen people leave dogmatic religion and they just run as far as they can away from it and they intentionally go and do crazy stuff because they just never got a chance to and they want to see what that's like or something um and i think that because some people do that for a period it gives christians this impression that that's what they're gonna that's what you're gonna do you know oh you left you get that straw man right you left christianity so you could go be gay or you could go snort coke or do look at porn or whatever and you're like dude my health habits haven't changed at all. You know, if anything, they've improved. So I'm like spending more time just being mindful and appreciating the things I have instead of stressing about the last days coming and everyone being ready for it, you know? So yeah, I mean, that's kind of where I'm at right now, man. Mm, I love it. And I would definitely ditto the the sentiment that you're kind of weaving through that, that life as you get grounded and do some healing and, and i love that you, you mentioned the idea of um, you know some of us really do need counseling uh for a season when this is you know uh, happening to us but like as you get through that and you get past it just to really realize you're truly a better person and that for whatever amount of time you have left in your life uh hopefully as, as much as possible that just that you have a chance now to truly be the the real person that you should have been this whole time like you could have mm -hmm. been you and it was always you in the under the shadow and the and the umbrella of of Yahweh and the Bible and the church. Mm -hmm. And to realize that, that 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 stuff never actually should have mattered. And it's like there is a huge grieving process. And I would argue it's 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 appropriate to have a, an angry atheist phase. Be like, yeah, I was this, mad. I was mad for a while. Yeah, like very you guys, sarcastic. <laughs> you guys tricked me. You, sh you should have known better. Yeah. I mean, I, and I, it's funny, I still I don't think I'm super angry, but I, I still have this like this sense of of just it just doesn't make any sense that the Christians in my life like they still don't want to know all this stuff we talked about in in the summary, but like it's it's they're important things to dive into and understand what does that mean what what do you mean when you say we don't know who the gospel authors were and other stuff similar like like that there originally mm -hmm. were at least 60 gospels and some people have argued i think appropriately that there probably were hundreds of gospels originally like what do all these kind of things mean in the greco-roman mythology but i'm angry that they're so blinded that they don't even care it's like um mm -hmm. george orwell's kind of stuff like you don't have yes. to protect them from it they don't want to know they don't yep. care it's it's like it's like um someone saying uh, you know can can i can I tell you what the weather's like on the other side of the planet today? Like you could tell me if you want to, but I don't really care. I want to know, you know, my story. I just, you know, the Jesus stuff, mm -hmm. whether, you know, you know, in some remote Island somewhere that I'll never be at, I don't care what the weather's like there today. And right. it's like, it's just so far removed from their perspective. It just never impacts it when it actually should. Mm -hmm. And the fact that they are completely ambivalent to me, it's like, it, it, it keeps the anger that, that I went through at first, but it keeps it right in front of my face. Cause I'm like, this is, it didn't just hurt my life and steal from my life. It's actively stealing from people that I love and that don't, they truly don't care. Um, mm -hmm. 
Anyway, yeah. I, I digress there. I I did want to ask specifically to the um, one last question about your deconversion part of it. The afterlife did it mm. did it kill you to think that there's possibly not an afterlife, and where did you land with that? And would sure. you you know I ask this a lot, but would you have wanted to live forever if you could have? Yeah. Um, no, I don't think I'd want to live forever if I could. Um, but I, so initially, I landed on. Like I said before, if you can't show me something and prove it to me, then then it's over. Like we're dead. And I think it was good for me to to hold on to that perspective for a while. And I I probably did for six months to a year. I just felt like, you know, well, when we die, we just go on the ground. That's it. End of consciousness. End of tape recording. And I realized pretty quickly that that's not really scary, because there's nothing to be afraid of. Like if it's just over, then it's just over. Like there's no, there's no hell, you know, there's no torment, nor am I going to be forced to sing worship songs to Jesus for all of eternity either. <laughs> you know, it's like, I don't know it, when you're dead, you don't know you're dead. You know, um, that's kind of the perspective I held for a while. Um, uh, to be frank with you, and this is not popular among most agnostic atheists, some of them, but not most that I've noticed but I'm I'm Justin Best, man. I just say what I believe. I got really interested in um, the University of Virginia reincarnation studies. And also, I've always been interested in near-death experience studies. Um, also, past life regression, hypnotherapy, um, and other out-of-body, like psychedelic experiences and things like that. But mostly for me, what really uh, got me thinking that reincarnation is a real possibility is the university of virginia studies that have been conducted and are still being conducted there and i have a couple of books um that are really good about this and what i mean by when i say evidence i think that they provide good evidence and what i mean by this is i'll just give you an example that i like to give and there's hundreds of examples like this but this is just a good easy one so a little girl was uh, born in a village um, and I can't remember what, maybe Pakistan or something. And when she was four or five, for one, a lot of, a lot of kids who remember past lives, um, a lot of them also speak really well at a very young age. And some of them even speak languages they were never taught. It's called xenoglossy. And it's also a real phenomenon that exists. Kids knowing languages they never learned. Um, but let's say, for example, this little girl was born, and by the time she's four or five, she's talking very well, and she's saying that her mom is not her mom, that you're not my mom, you're just my pretend mom, you're my new mom, and you're, you know, she's talking about her dad, like you're not my real dad, you're my, you're my, you're just like my fake dad, and they, they would just like, what are you talking about, you know? So as they progress through this, she explains that her name is Hassan, and she's a man, and she lives. She's thirty something years old. She got hit by a bike on a car in a car accident. A car hit her while she was riding her bicycle, and it knocked her off, and she died. And now she's here, and now she's in a, a little girl's body, and it's frustrating for her because she misses her family. And a lot of parents will dismiss this type of uh, talk from kids. Um, as just being like, you know, fanatical, fantastic or uh, imagination. But what, what has happened is some people take it seriously enough to they actually investigate and try and connect the dots. And so it turns out this girl was describing a man who died uh, just across the village from her, like two or three miles from where she lived, who had died seven years earlier. Now she was only like four or something. So that's another weird part of it is like, there seems to be no understanding of if if reincarnation is real, there's no like jiving, like how long you're gone before you come back. I, I don't know. It, again, like that's not very scientific. So I don't like to talk about that part of it. But I do know this that she knew uh, she showed, she sh led these people to her real actual address where she lived that she had never been to before. She knew everyone that lived there and the dog's name. And she told all of them all these stories about Hassan. And so much so that this family literally has like pseudo adopted her into the family. And they all are 100% convinced this is Hassan because you're talking like inside jokes. 
nicknames, memories, all this stuff of being Hassan. That's like, that's the type of evidence I'm talking about. And there's literally hundreds of these. So I hate when I bring up reincarnation, people roll their eyes. They think I'm talking about someone who's like, oh, I was a World War II pilot and I can't prove any of that. You just got to believe me. And I'm like, that that that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about PhD doctors going and verifying cases of kids knowing way too much about someone who died just recently. And they're saying that that was them. So that's the type of stuff I'm talking about. And when you combine that type of research <clears throat> with like sort of the near-death experience research, I know that most agnostic atheists believe that consciousness does not survive the brain death. But there's plenty of studies that say that it does survive brain death. And even after the brain has completely been depleted of oxygen, that consciousness is still hovering around the body and paying attention to people and listening to things going on in the room and things like this. So I, I guess maybe it's like just uh, I try not to be hyper spiritual because I, I, I'm annoyed by hyper spiritual people because I like evidence and I don't want people trying to sell me something, you know. So I don't talk about this frequently because I myself am like very averse to this type of stuff. But I think it's possible. I think it's possible that uh, consciousness is um, sort of revolving or something. And I also, I also personally believe that we are all the same person and that we're all just experiencing life from different perspectives and we're all essentially a source from the same consciousness that we call God, but I don't believe in God in, in any traditional sense whatsoever. I just, I just think we're all kind of like the same energy being used, manifested through different persons and personalities and things like that. So kind of new agey stuff I know. And again, I'm not selling any beads or bracelets or prayer mats or anything. I don't recommend any of that stuff. I think that the, the most, the healthiest thing for all of us to do. And I think the point of life actually is not to worry about any of that. I think I've come to the conclusion that the point of life is to be present and to experience what you're actually experiencing right now and to fully enjoy it and um, and not worry about what's going to come next because there's really just nothing to worry about. But it is certainly reassuring and, and uh, comforting for some to believe that maybe they'll come back again and again and again. Maybe they already have, you know. That's good. That's comfortable. But I don't, I don't think that um, I would ever, you know, like, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't die for that. That's for sure. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. That's fascinating so, stuff. I I've not, uh, heard about a lot of that and seen yeah. those studies. So I'll have to do some reading at some point. That's, that's really curious. Um, yeah, yeah it, it definitely seems like at the very least that there's, there's a, a naturalism that we all tend to lean on when we're agnostics and atheists, but to just admit that there is still a mystery of life. Mm -hmm. And there's there are unexplained things. You know, I, I remember growing up seeing these documentaries where you know twins they grow up and as as adults they go to separate parts of the country or even the world, and one of them has a car accident or something or a heart attack, and the other person immediately like feels something Knows wrong. About it. Yeah, call, calls like what's what's happening in the family. Mm -hmm. It's like, well, how did you know that? Uh, you know, there mm -hmm. are some mysteries in life that are really uh, worth thinking about, even if we can't have the answers. And I think it's it's great to like you said, like in one way, like, don't worry about it. Just be present, mm -hmm. embrace the mystery of, of what you've got, make the life as beautiful as you can. And, you know, if you learn more things, there's more evidence that comes along that maybe some of these things that we're just, eh, I'm not sure. It's cool. just interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Like I learned something new and exactly. you know, we, we don't know. We don't know. We could, we could be, we could be all in, in um, you know, this whole universe could be a, a, a basically a molecule and in, in somebody's watering can, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. we don't know where, what the universe is and, and where we came from and where it's headed. But um, I think just bringing it back to our, 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 you know, our kind of wrap up in our story, I just want to say, you know, thank you for the, the big picture. But I, I kind of kept on hearing it throughout your story of, and I know we probably didn't get to, a, you know, a whole bunch of it, but just the, the, the trajectory that you gave us, which I really appreciate, I kept hearing loud and clear, like you wanted the truth more than anything else and that you were willing to change and that people were you know, their feathers were ruffled, as they say, just over the, over the fact that you really wanted to know what was true. Even if you lose Paul, even if you lose Jesus of all things, like whatever it takes, you want the truth. It doesn't matter what the cost is. You, do, you, you, 
And it's amazing to me when you look at the word um, integrity, like Christians would say, we want you to be a person of integrity. Well, integrity is like, you know, keeping everything woven together. And like, you're trying to, to pursue the truth and be able to say, does this, does this fact really merge with this fact? Do they, do they, do they butt heads or they, are they okay together? And the fact that you're willing to be, you know, technically a person of integrity, even if that integrity literally takes you out of Christianity, that takes guts. It really does. And a lot of people, um, it just, it's terrifying to even think about that. On that note, and maybe a final, very quick wrap up question. How have you been treated? Did, were you shunned at all? Um, like what was, what was the final outcome of this since your deconversion? What was it like a year or two ago? You said. Yeah, about two years ago, okay. I uh, I publicly announced like, mm. yeah, I took my my videos down. But how lo- uh, start with loved ones. How have loved ones treated you, and then go to the broader community. Sure. So my loved ones had already ostracized me. My parents and I had already fallen apart because they hated my Christian Truthers channel even before I got into Torah. They didn't they didn't like me disagreeing with John MacArthur, and their ego wouldn't allow them allow them me the room to do that. So my parents and their friends and their pastors and things were all watching my stuff. And at first they wanted me to be a pastor with them and they loved my zeal. And then they were like, oh, he's saying things that aren't part of the uh, Presbyterian Churches of America handbook. So <laughs> so they, they got really irritated with me as time progressed. And in, in in, when I went to Torah and started keeping the Shabbat, they, they'd want me to hang out with them on Saturdays and I wouldn't for birthday parties and they get really mad at me about it. And so they had this way of making me into the, being the problem with like the family, because uh, I wouldn't eat this when they cooked it. I wouldn't come over on this day. I'm over. And I had this, by the way, I had a huge beard, like a really, really long beard. But they're always talking crap about my beard and how stupid it looks and I should cut it off and just very narcissistic. You know, they were narcissistically abusive to me my whole life. So I just, I was just used to it, but by the time I got out of got out of Christian Truthers and went to bullet holes in the Bible, we were already done. I had already not spoken to my parents for a couple of months, probably. And um, once once I told and my brothers and sisters, we never talked either. All of my siblings have sort of divorced my parents over time for different reasons, and we're all spread out all over the world now in different countries and places, and we hardly talk anymore. So my my external sort of family is is not really in the picture. And they weren't really in the picture when I deconstructed either. My close family, thankfully, came with me on the journey, my wife and kids. I've always kept them extremely involved in everything I'm doing. And we, you know, that's another video, but we had a long talk with them and they they were excited to leave uh, Torah with us. And um, the community at large, <laughs> I, I think I laugh when I'm nervous. The community at large just hates me, man. Like, um, I think when I first posted um, Jesus is Dionysus, that video, and I took, it was a week or two after I'd taken down all my videos, I lost 10,000 subscribers, I want to say in like two weeks. So I had 50,000 and it went dropped down to 40. And then uh, I kept posting more and more stuff and it just went lower and lower and lower. I got back down to like 35,000. Every single, I couldn't post, for the first year or two, I couldn't post anything on YouTube without receiving just nothing but hate comments. Like I have a demon, I'm the antichrist. I'm doing this for all these sidebar reasons. I'm doing it because I want to be gay or stuff. I love it. They just, they just attack you for all these ridiculous reasons that don't even exist. Mm. Um, so I, I got my first taste of that, like Christian love probably two years ago where I realized like they were really mad at me. Like they really, really couldn't wait for me to die. And I mean that literally, because they were saying that they were saying, God's going to kill you. God's going to punish you. You're going to hit, wait till you get hit by a car and then you will see who Yahweh has the last laugh. And people were writing me emails and messages and they really want me to die. Like they wanted me to die. And it, it hurt my feelings, man. Like, I'll be honest with you. Like, I cried over it a lot. Like, I did. I cried and cried. I um, I couldn't believe that some of the people who I was friends with um, that really respected me so much, even through, like, the controversial stuff I posted, they still respected me. They still came along for the ride. I had gone too far now. Now they, now they you know, I had, like, lost all hope. I was irredeemable, unrecoverable, immoral, you know? So, um, 
yeah, I literally to this day, like you can go look at my YouTube channel. When I post on YouTube, I still get the same not it's not as bad as it used to be because over time people have just left finally and are leaving me alone. Yeah. But it's still there. Like probably probably twenty percent of my comments t- to this day are still Christians who have been following me for five, six years who are just they're just following me so they can tell me that I suck and that I'm wrong and that they're praying for me, you know. So um However, when I went on TikTok and I just started my TikTok like 10 months ago, that that was a totally different different thing. Like I loved and still do love TikTok because when I started sharing the same information, the same knowledge, the same ideas on TikTok, it was extremely popular. Um and I got a ton of support, ton of love, and I found out that like literally even when I was a Christian and I had Christians encouraging me, to an extent in my comments and saying nice things about my work or whatever, like that wasn't anything compared to the amount of love, support and kindness I get from the atheists. Like now that I'm out, like I love this community so much, like seriously, people are so empathetic and like so open and so humble, like compared to like, I guess the, the ego, egoic Christian behaviors that I've seen in the past. So it's been hard. I, I really feel like I don't really have very many friends, to be honest with you. I have very few actual friends. Um, well, you got one now in Atlanta, Georgia. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, man. Thanks, dude. I would love to check you out when I come up there again. Yeah. I like that area. But well, My heart breaks yeah. for your family situation, of course. That's that's very heartbreaking. Um, and and I definitely get the comment YouTube kind of comments all the time. Um, it's It's amazing to me the idea that they don't get it that there's a there's the ver- there's even verses that say you'll they'll know we're Christians by our love, mm-hmm. and I know you can always say, well, the most loving thing to do is to tell you the truth. I get that, <laughs> but like, like there's no grace, there's no sense of like you know you you're winning me by your be- good great behavior, mm-hmm. and it also it, it's a great demonstration to me that there's no power in the gospel. Right, um, you, the, the gospel isn't transforming you. You're you're just you're doing what you naturally would do. And what you naturally would do is you'd be a, you know, some of these commenters would just be jerks and that's what they mm-hmm. do. They just, be, they're just jerks. Um, yep. But, and it's, it's amazing too, that they don't really like, I, I, I say this a lot, but these dynamics are such a strong testimony to the reality that when you get childhood indoctrination and, or even some adult indoctrination, but especially childhood where it just gets to the very deepest parts of who you are, the idea that maybe that worldview is incorrect is just too much to take and they just can't mm-hmm. take it and they have to either ignore you or lash out at you. And it really, it burdens my heart. Um, and this is, you know, more my platform I'm getting into now, but just the idea of like, this matters, not just for the the grown adults who are wanting and searching out for where are the mythological origins of the New Testament and how do I talk about healing from these things like purity culture, but like, a big part of this now has to become, yeah, it's it's about us first. It's about our journey first. But how do we do better for the next generation? Because we're seeing the outcome. The outcome in our in our YouTube comments is when you heavily indoctrinate people, they turn into Christian jerks. And like, how do you save the next generation from this bizarre mythological worldview that's hurting our planet so much? And it's like, to me, like, and I'm, I'm going to answer that question now. That's a big part of what I do, but you know, yeah. the, the answers to that question are such a big burden on my heart because I'm like, I want to give the next generation a better shot than we did. Me um, too. And just, yeah. And, and, and admit that this is psychological child abuse. When you teach these kids this garbage and you make them think that fantasy is reality and you tell them they're wicked and there's a, you know, a, a ancient Canada demigod that hates them, you mm-hmm. know, kind of loves them, but kind of hates them. Mm-hmm. Um, it's like, come on, just, we can do better. We as, we as humans, we've got a lot of ways in which we're not doing so good as humans, as humanity, but we can do better than this. We really can. We, yeah. It's time to step up as a culture to, the, to, you know, to, the, to our future. Humanity's future is kind of in our hands, as it were. And that future is going to look a lot brighter if we can get mythology you know, in, in the rearview mirror, as they say. So anyway, I'm, I'm, that's my little soapbox for the day. Oh, I um, completely agree, man. I completely agree. I feel like we have a lot of healing from religious trauma to do as a nation. And I'm with you, bro. Like to me, the future looks beautiful without, without Christianity. And hopefully we can get there soon. Mm, absolutely. 
Well, I uh, know I've kept you probably way over uh, what we expected, but this has been awesome. Um, this is great. I know I say it a lot, but I really mean it when I say it to you. I definitely want to do this again. I'd love to collaborate. Yeah. Um, come on your channel next, maybe. But I definitely want to keep the conversation going. And I just want to end by saying thank you for your story today. And thank you for what you've been doing. Thank you for being willing to take the um, the abuse, basically, not just the abuse that you took as, as you know, as a Christian from the psycho character, Yahweh, and from your, you know, Christian friends and family. But thank you for being willing to take the abuse that you, I'm sure, foresaw that if you, if you, opened up to the you know vulnerably what's what's on your mind that people are going to attack you there's a lot of people that and, and some people appropriately so just say i i, I gotta go into stealth mode here mm-hmm. you were willing to to not go into stealth mode on this and that means a lot to me i really appreciate it that you were willing to take the the route of v- developing a thick skin and being willing to say this is too important not to share so thank you thank you so much oh man thank you exactly right back at you man i mean you're doing the same thing and so, like, I tell all the other deconstructionists out there on TikTok who are doing this work, if as an ex-combat Marine, if I could give you a badge of bravery or something, I definitely would. Because I really appreciate your empathy on that, though. It, it means a lot. Because as you know, we've been through a lot. So thank you right back, bro. I, I, I'm I glad to be in this uh, in this war with you as your partner. And I'd love to keep working with you in the future, man. Anytime. Mm-hmm. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. My privilege. Well, I'll just end that by saying we've been speaking, uh, everyone, with Justin Best. Justin, uh, thank you so much again. Everyone, please go like and subscribe and all this stuff. Great stuff. Um, it gets even, the rabbit hole just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Justin, thanks again. Uh, we really appreciate your time today. Anytime, bro. Thank you. Thank you.